I take four. Dopey podcast, Dopey Nation, we're all in. Dopey Nation, Dopey podcast, Dopey Nation, stay strong. This episode of Dopey is sponsored by Oro Recovery. They are located in sunny Southern California, in Malibu, in Silver Lake, and somewhere in Western Los Angeles. They were created by our very good friend Bob Forrest and his very good friends, Evan, Jared, and Bob. Their mission to help addicts and alcoholics to get well through connection and compassion rather than control. Their staff has many, many, many decades of experience in treating alcoholism, drug addiction, and co-occurring mental health disorders, including the dread SMI. Their amenities are sick, surfing, equine therapy, sound bath meditation, of course, the potentially spiritually transformative sweat lodge. They boast a comfortable detox, which we all love, a comfortable detox. So if you're ready to make a decision, if you're ready to get ready, I cannot suggest Oro enough. If you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, go to Oro. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our great friends at Soberlink. As we all know, addiction is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Nearly 15 million people in the U.S. have an alcohol use disorder, and that is alcohol use only, not other drugs. Only 10% of those people get treatment. This can be attributed to the stigma that surrounds addiction and how people don't want to talk about it. Soberlink supports the no-judgment zone that is dopey and strives to erase the stigma of alcohol addiction. Their remote alcohol monitoring tool has helped over 500,000 people to be more accountable in their sobriety. The Dopey Podcast was started with open and honest conversations about addiction and recovery, and Soberlink encourages this to help rebuild trust and maintain sobriety. We've teamed up with Soberlink to create a healthy habits guide for those in recovery. Visit www.soberlink.com slash dopey to download that healthy habits guide. And if you or someone you know can benefit from accountability for alcohol recovery, you'll also find a form on that page to get a $50 off promo code on the Soberlink device exclusive to you guys in the Dopey Nation. So again, it's www.soberlink.com slash dopey and let Soberlink help you help someone to stay off of the sauce. All right, this episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our very good friends at Sober Buddy. I know I've talked to you guys about the Sober Buddy app before and I think you should check it out. But what I want to tell you today is that Sober Buddy has just opened a crowdfunding campaign that allows you and me to own a piece of the company, which is super cool. You help them raise the money they need, and they give you shares. It is a win-win. This is an amazing opportunity. You can purchase shares in the regular crowdfunding offering and raise capital for future expansion. You can find the link to their campaign on our website, dopeypodcast.com, or on their website, yoursoberbuddy.com. Sober Buddy has already helped over 30,000 people on their sober journey, and this is your chance to help them get their app out to even more people. So check it out. Give them some love to support a product that helps people achieve sobriety, which is what we're all about, and sign up for their app so you can have your own Sober Buddy today. Before we get to the show, I wanted to tell you guys about an amazing podcast called Unfiltered. Everyone has an opinion about sex work, but few people actually listen to the sex workers themselves. Enter, dopey guest, Holly Randall, unfiltered. Holly Randall was a dopey guest. She is also a second-generation pornographer and the daughter of the trailblazing 
Erotic photographer Suze Randall. Holly interviews the biggest names in porn like Nicole Aniston, Angela White, Sasha Gray, and Elsa Jean. Forget everything you think you know about porn because this podcast will change and blow your mind. Holly and her guests trade real behind-the-scenes stories like the time a male performer called his mom crying when he couldn't get it up on set and go deep about near-death experiences, spiritual awakenings, addiction, and religion. You can find it everywhere you find your podcasts. Holly Randall Unfiltered. It's an incredible show. One last announcement before we get to the show, which is for the dopes out there. All the dopes in the Dopey Nation. Are you tired of your boring recovery routine and do you need a meeting? I'm sure you do. Are you searching for a new Sangha? Are you lost in the doposphere and could benefit from some connection? Well, look no further because Dopey Zoom is there for you. They hit the recovery hard and the butt plugs even harder. That's right. There's 25 meetings a week led by dopes trying to get their shit together just like you and me. It doesn't matter if you're an NA, AA, no A, Dharma, the drunk tank, or detox. The Dopey Zoom is here for you and celebrating two years of existence at the end of March with a balls to the walls marathon full of speakers, meditations, whip the rap god, mic dropping, games, and the second annual Dopey Zoom talent show. Find the schedule in the Dopey Nation Facebook group or the ever controversial Dopey Podcast subreddit. The Zoom Link ID is always 804-300-586. The password is toodles, all lowercase. Enough with these fucking ads. Here is the fucking show. Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. My name is Dave, <clears throat> and I am sitting in my father's apartment with strung out author and unlicensed advice columnist, Aaron Carr. Welcome back. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, do you feel like, what's your, what's your level of appreciation of, of Dopey at this point? You've been doing the show for what, months? Yeah, since How many? Like September. Wow. Since September, it's mm -hmm. now February. Wow. How the fuck is it February? Although January was like eight years long, but. And uh, you, you've been coming around here and there. I think you've done a great job. Thanks. What has been your takeaway from your involvement in the doposphere? I mean, I'm just bummed that I didn't get involved earlier because, I mean, I love the Dopey Nation. I think that, like, you have an amazing audience. That's smart um, to say. Because they're no, listening. It's not even, <laughs> that's not even why I'm saying it. I really believe that. We did the, the, the Patreon Zoom Oh, on yeah, Saturday. yeah, before you say another thing. Yeah, yeah. Listen, dopey audience, the people that she's complimenting. There's something out there called Dopey Patreon, mm -hmm. right? Let's say the dopey audience is around 15,000 people, mm -hmm. which is a nice number, a nice chunk of people. Yeah. Not even 1% of them. Are in Patreon. I think it's actually larger than that. Well, what's 1% of 15,000? No, I'm saying I think that, that that your audience is larger than 15,000. I think it's around 15,000. All right, 000. all right. Okay, but what's 1% of 15,000? 1% of 15,000 is 1,500? Yeah, we're not close to 1%. Is that right? I don't think so. I think no. that's 10%. My math is terrible. Me too. Forget it. Let's, right. uh, we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> the point is that there's something called Dopey Patreon, and if you support Dopey Patreon... You uh, are supporting the show, plus you're getting oodles and oodles of, of bonus information, bonus shows, videos, music. Uh, the whole Megillah is out there. <laughs> but uh, what, what Aaron is talking about is that every month, on the last Saturday of every month at 930, we do the Dopey Patreon Zoom. And Aaron has been to a few. And now why don't you share your experience? I think it's an amazing thing that you do this, first of all. And I think that, like, if you're a fan of the show, if you think that we're entertaining or annoying or funny or whatever, I mean, not me. I mean, I'm not, it's really you that they're buying into. But it's really fun to come and hang out with audience members and people who you may have heard on the show. And there's a 
weird game that we play <laughs> that, that you could win a prize yeah. for. And it's just nice. It's like a good way to connect. And I don't know. I just, I, you know, like, I think for anyone who's like gone through addiction, we spent so many years like being disconnected from other people and it's a really, really nice way to connect. And especially since we're still like in the midst of, you know, COVID, the COVID years, <laughs> it's really nice to have like a place to connect with people and like have fun and, and just remember that you're not alone in this. And as annoying as most Zooms are, the dopey Patreon Zoom isn't that annoying. It really isn't. I mean, maybe I like it because I'm I'm self centered and it's like about dopey, <laughs> and I like I can be like my little talk show host, and that's fun. I really enjoy that. Yeah, but you also, I mean, but it's also super interactive. It isn't like the Dave Show. It's like really about everybody who's there, which is nice. It is nice, and I and I actually I used to dread it and fear it, and now I only dread it and fear it a little bit. <laughs> it's um, progress. It's good, and then also. Around Dopey Patreon, this week, very rarely do I post free Dopey Patreon content. The truth is that the first, like, 10 weeks that we did Patreon, everything was free. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, somebody was like, you're not, it's not how you do Patreon. You got to charge, <laughs> you got to charge for it. So, like, if you go on to www.patreon.com slash Dopey Podcast, you will see a lot of free stuff in there. And last week it was kind of creepy, which is that, uh, I, I know I've talked about this on the show. There's a woman named Stephanie who is a psychic out in, uh, Washington state. And she, uh, believes that she was contacted by Chris. Uh, the first time she wrote me was years ago when we were coming back from Kalahari water park. And like my whole family was bugged out. And then we did a, a Patreon episode with her. I might have put that one up for free also. Mm -hmm. This one, she sent me a picture that she took uh, outside her window on her deck uh, in where she saw Chris in her window. And I totally freaked out. And, um, and we recorded a Patreon about it. And it is available for you guys right now for free at www.patreon.com slash Dobie Podcast. Go listen. I would love your opinion about the uh, the spirit of Chris that may or may not be in touch with Psychic Steph. I have not been visited by Chris in any dreams or meditations or anything. Um, but she says he's doing well, so I like that. I like that, too. And we actually... <laughs> We started talking about this to record the intro and went off on such a tangent that Dave is going to release it as a bonus Patreon episode. Yeah, but that you got to pay for. It. That's yeah. not going to be yeah. free. And it's fun, though. It's good. And also there's a sneak peek of, of Willie from Katz's. Yes, Katz's. yes, yes. Which is really, really good. And then today on my uh, on my journey to get here, like we got stuck in such traffic, me and fucking Willie. And Willie, like, Willie's this classic, like, they call him time rider at work because he's always stealing time. Like, every, he's one of the guys that, like, he goes on every mission. If somebody needs something, mm -hmm. he goes and gets it. So, like, this morning I get to work and I'm like, Willie, we have to deliver this shit by 1220. He's like, he's like I got gotcha. you. And, and then he leaves to take care of this, that, and the other thing. He comes back at 12 oh. and... um. And he with a ham sandwich, right? And and a bunch of sandwiches. And we bear in mind we work at the best deli in the right. world. And they go to we, another deli brought, to get sandwiches. When you said that, when you said he gave you a ham sandwich, I didn't realize he brought it from somewhere else. No, all the guys at Cats is buy sandwiches from other places. Well, I guess it's the kind of thing too where you kind of get sick of eating the same thing all the time. Yeah, well, right. you have to, but there's also this other deli, and you know, <laughs> not that Cats is certainly not paying to advertise on Dopey. There's a deli called Parisi's. Have you ever been to Parisi's? Oh, yeah. That fucking the place. Italian place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go to Paris, I mean, Katz is best sandwiches in the world, but Parisi's is pretty good. Yeah. They it's do a these different kind of sandwich. Semolina Hero with the yes. seeds, oh, chicken the cutlet seeds. with the fresh mm -hmm. mozzarella, and uh, and Willie gave me half a ham sandwich. And you know what? I think I want to play the Willie bit. Do it. All right. This is Willie. Um, I don't know. Kind of just talking about. One of the things at Katz's is, is that, I don't know, I think during COVID, everybody kind of decided they should be involved in the stock market. 
And uh, and this is kind of Willie's response to that. All right, so I'm in the car with Willie. We're, we're going on a delivery. And we're talking about how the guys on the back counter now trade stocks. What's your take on it, Will? I think they're all suckers. Why? Because they're getting into something shit they don't know about yet. Those are for professionals. They're not know, they ain't, they ain't no Wall Street guys over there. They think they're in the stock market. These are for people that know shit. They have been in there years studying this shit. These guys work on, they, they go to one from one day to the other. Oh, this thing is good. You should buy this. You should buy that. So and you I think, think you think they're just clowns and they don't know what they're I doing? I think they're clowns not doing that. They're not doing what they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they haven't done the research real good on that. You don't see anybody retiring out of there on the stock market shit. Are you crazy? I see a lot of them hanging themselves. Maybe losing their houses. That's for sure. Anything else, Willie? Any, what's, what's the drug scene like where you're at on the Lower East Side? The drugs? Uh, it's flowing a little bit, but now that everything is free, I don't know if anybody's going to make money now. Now everything is legal. I'm not talking about that. You're, you live where? On Avenue C, Avenue D? Me? Not, well, I used to live on Avenue D. A lot of kidding back in the days. Where do you live at now? I live on by Pitt Street. And what's, what's the scene over there? Which is not, it's not that great either. It's not are people great. selling dope on the street outside your building? Uh, not outside, but around the area they are. In the stairwells? No, no, no I mean, not in the stairwell, like around the blocks. That uh, that that thing about uh, you go to Delancey, you probably see a few of them over there. Definitely. I never saw anybody on Delancey, but oh, it, oh, but on Pitt Street, moment. in the in the downstairs and then into the stairwells. That's what it was for me. Oh, in the stairwells? No, yeah, I don't see too many of those. But back in um, Avenue D, I used to see a lot of them. Even going down the stairs, you bumping them. But I, but those, you know, it's funny. Those guys are friendly. They're not really they're not really dangerous. So you're saying things are pretty tame right now on Pitt Street? Actually, yes, yeah, they are. At the moment. At the moment. Willie, anything else you want to say to the Dopey Nation before we go? Uh, the Dopey Nation? Shit, you know? Stay strong. The most incredible thing about that is that... Oh, I guess Willie did listen to Dopey, so he knew to yeah. say stay strong. Yeah. I just thought it was, like, random that he was just saying stay strong. No, no, no. He listens. You know, I lived in... Uh, before I ever did heroin and before, you know, when I was in, I just graduated from Katz's. We lived in a, graduated from Katz's, graduated from college. <laughs> Wait, you we said lived, that I was like, what? I was working at Katz's and I was like 21 or mm-hmm. something. And me and my friend Jim were sublenting, sublenting. What's wrong <laughs> with me? Subletting an apartment upstairs on this, in this building on Norfolk Street. And there were heroin dealers who, worked in the building they worked in the in the downstairs and they were the friendliest guys Mm -hmm. and i think it's because they they wanted to like protect the building and they wanted people to like them of course just in case anything went wrong yeah and they kept all their dope like tucked in the stair Mm -hmm. and i and like it's so funny to become a heroin like a horrible heroin addict and then think about the fact that you lived in this building with with probably like this incredible heroin that was super cheap to you but that would have been a terrible time to start using (sighs) yeah and then in other news, this uh, this week was this horrible blizzard. Yes. How yes. was it here in Manhattan? It wasn't that bad. I mean, it, it snowed. The wind was really bad. It was really, really windy. Where we live, we got two feet. I know. We only got like eight inches. We got two feet. And I went out and started digging. You know, I start. And, and Linda's like, I was like, I think I should go out and start digging. And she's like, she's like, you should just wait until it's over. And I was like, I think it's going to be a lot. I think if I do it now, I think that's what people do. They go out every hour or something and right. start digging. And uh, and then I was like, and then I went out and I it's like I, I had these wool gloves uh-huh. and like they got wet and I was like I was like oh, my fingers are going to fall off. I'm like shoveling and I'm freezing and I get back inside and I'm freaking out. And a few hours go by and Linda goes, Dave, come here. And I was like, what? And she looked across the street and our neighbor is cleaning out his driveway with a snowblower. And she goes, you should go over there and ask him if he'll lend you the snowblower. And I was like, well, what are you going to (laughs) do? She's like, what do you mean? She goes, you want me to help you run the snowblower? I was like, no, but look, he has somebody cleaning his porch. And she's like, she gives me this look. She's sitting at the table in a robe with her glass of wine telling me to go out to (laughs) fucking snowblow. But like, that's what men where I live do. Right. You know, and I'm just less of a man than those men. Mm. Anyway, so I go over there. I get the snowblower. He starts talking about the actuators. Actual, there's some part of the snowblower is called the actuator, uh-huh. I think, and it controls which direction the snow is 
thrown. Right. I personally prefer the expression snow thrower to snow blower. Because when you yeah. throw in the snow, it sounds even more masculine to me than blowing the snow. <laughs> Forget about, forget blowing in general, but right. just when you're throwing, you throw in the snow right. in Long Island. You Rather know? than going like. Right. Or even worse, <laughs> right, right, right. blowing the snow. <laughs> anyway, so he shows me how this actuator works and it's like, it's, you think it's really easy. You're mm -hmm. just going to kind of push this thing and like every, it's going to go through it and come out, but it doesn't work like that. There's like fucking, there's two feet, but since there's so much wind, it goes up to like three, Drifts. three, mm -hmm. three feet or something. And yeah, and you can't just push it through. You have to rock it back and yes. forth. And have you done this before? No, but you're my, saying yes, like you. Because you, my dad has one, and I, my stepmom like <laughs> sent video of my dad doing this because they had like drifts up to four feet in Rhode Island. Snow throwing. Yeah. So I'm doing that. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. And then I'm like, fuck it. I'm gonna do the path up to my house. Right. And I did that. And I come back. And I'm like. I start the the actuator mm -hmm. is blowing and if I say the word wrong please correct me in an email <laughs> to dopeypodcast at gmail dot com and I'm and I'm like you know this is kind of throwing it where I'm blowing it kind of thing <laughs> like it's kind of like in the way like it's not really doing enough it's not going far enough yeah. so I was like I'm gonna change the direction of it where it's getting thrown so i changed the direction but the winds were so bad that when i changed the direction and i started throwing the snow it went right in it's my face, face yeah. terrible <laughs> but i i fucking did it i i snow throwed or blowed the whole driveway and, and brought it back and i felt very masculine that, i'm really proud of you it was a really mask and then linda posted it on facebook oh she did <laughs> yes because she was she was like she said she was going to call it Dave in the sub her Dave in the suburbs series, <laughs> which I thought was very nice. Um, so that's what I did, and um, I felt good about it. I'm thinking about investing in a snow thrower. I think you should because where you live, like when there's a snowstorm, you get a lot of snow, right? We do at times, you know. Um, but last year we didn't. I mean, I think like if a snow thrower costs like four hundred bucks. It's like, how many snows do you need to blow or throw for it to be worth your while? <laughs> you know, that's the question. How much are you really paying for? I think it's worth, I mean, were you going to go out there and have a heart attack shoveling snow? No, like get a snowblower. If it's this, like, this morning, right? I think it's worth it. I think if you own a house where, where you potentially get a lot of snow, and some years we get a lot of snow, some years we don't. What about the climate change? Yeah, but remember like when I first moved back to New York, like 2013 and 2014, we had like those horrible, like blizzardy polar vortex winters. Yes. There was so much snow. Right. That's true. All right. Maybe we'll get it. Um, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah. This morning I'm mm -hmm. going to the train. I left late. I'm wearing these big boots. I'm carrying all of my gear. And I, I, leave, I have to leave my house like five minutes before the train comes. And, mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm perfect. Today I left my house two minutes <sighs> before the train comes. And I'm running. With my big boots. Wait, and do you walk to the train station? Yeah, I'm running with my That's big right, boots okay. and my backpack and the fucking roadcaster. And I'm like, bruh, bruh. and I, I, I think I ran like a block or something and I'm like dying. Ugh. So it's like, I think today was a big wake up call to my cardio fitness and it's time. Okay, Dopey Nation, Dopey Fitness Challenge is about to get back in effect. So get with it. Okay, but also I'm going to be like the total nag friend right now. And you have to make an appointment for a physical. It's on my list of okay. things to do. I, I <laughs> see it's like, I, hold on. It's somewhere on there. Okay. Um, but yes, that's coming. Call the doc. David, you got to call, <laughs> call the, the doctor. doctor. <laughs> so uh, it's there. We'll call the doctor. And this week, okay, last week, as I, I am kind of a little bit addicted to social media, I noticed many reputable addiction recovery sources were playing a video from this young woman named Chloe LeBranch. Mm -hmm. and, and then I got like 10, 15 messages with people sending me this bit that she did. I'm going to play it right now. And, and so what do I do? I invite her on the show, right? <laughs> like, isn't that the move? Yeah. So this is Chloe LeBranch's bit about being cool in rehab. Rehab is just like high school. Uh, it is. It's cool in rehab. It's kind of like uh, the cool kids in rehab. Those are like the drug addicts, right? The losers, those are the alcoholics. Um, 
there's like a real hierarchy there. It's it's true because like uh, when you walk in into the the cafeteria, it's like it's like Mean Girls kind of. You walk in, the cool kids are at a table, the drug addicts, the losers, another table. So I walk in day one, I go to sit with the cool kids, the drug addicts. <laughs> they're, right? they're like, uh, you can't sit with us. <laughs> you can sit over there with the Chardonnay housewives. <laughs> I'm like, I'll show them that next fall. <laughs> right? So I spent the whole summer smoking crack. <laughs> I come back and I'm like, who's a loser now? <laughs> they're like, uh, still you, we do fentanyl. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I came back. I'm like, ah, where are they? They ghosted me. <laughs> they died. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a rough one. It's dark. I mean, it's funny, but it's dark. <laughs> and so I contacted Chloe LeBranch, and she came over to my dad's house. She sat where you're sitting, and she laid, like, some crazy raw dopey on us. She was two days sober when she came in. Three Three days. <laughs> Two or three Two days or three sober. Days. And uh, here she is, Chloe LeBranch. But before we get to Chloe LeBranch, I just want to tell you that this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash dopey podcast right now. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and dopey listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash DopeyPodcast. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash DopeyPodcast. Call them up, reach out, get help. I've been doing therapy. It's been incredibly helpful. I want you guys to get help, too. And without any further ado, here is the great Chloe LeBranch. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And my name is Dave. And I said that not in the way I usually say that. Your voice completely changed for that. Is that your podcast voice? This is my podcast voice. Yeah. Is it different? It got a little higher. I know. It gets higher. Yeah. Originally, I had a lower podcast voice. Are you trying to uh, appease to the non-binaries? Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to appeal to the not the thems out there. Yeah, good for you. Thank you. I'm very progressive. You just yeah. came on the most progressive recovery podcast yeah. there is. Anyone the disease is nobody's safe. Nobody's safe. This morning oh this is Chloe LeBranch. And yeah. if you don't know who Chloe LeBranch is, if you saw and I'm gonna play the clip. Of course. If you saw the clip that's where is it on YouTube or Instagram? Instagram. Yes, it's a big Instagram comedy rehab sensation. <laughs> would you say it's a sensation? Sure. Would you though? I would love to. It is a sensation where Chloe does a bit about not feeling like she's cool at rehab, and she sits down at the cool table in rehab. And I'm not going to ruin it. I'm going to play it. I'm not okay. going to play it now either, though. Yeah. I'm going to play it before all this. I think. All right, great. Um. Chloe's a comedian. She's from New York. Mm -hmm. and, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I called her this morning at 930 to like get her prepared. And she's like, fuck you. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I want to tell you about the show. She's like, what? It's a it's a recovery podcast, right? I was like, yeah, kind of. And I was like, I guess I could tell you about it when you get here. I was like, yeah, I've been on a podcast before I go I'm sleeping. And, like, <laughs> and it was a, it was a very like I was like, fuck, I shouldn't have called her. <laughs> that was a dumb move. And I, and I, but I did my research and I listened and I'm very excited to have you on the show because you've fucking been through it. Also, when you texted me the other day, I was like, oh God, what is this guy in love with me? <laughs> what did I text you? Hey, I was like, oh God. <laughs> what was it? What, what, what did I say? Nothing. I just thought you wanted to chat. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, come on, give me, you're giving me a, you're making me look bad to the audience here. I'm just kidding. Um, what was I going to say? So. Chloe, like, is, is she's going through it. She just sat down and she confessed a bunch of stuff. Can we start there? Sure, Father. All right, good. I'm, I'm the Jewish priest and you're the non-Jewish confessor. Here we go. Confessor. Confessor. Um, so. Forgive me, Father. When you put out that Instagram thing, how many people did you hear from? Um, 
a, a good amount. I, I mean, I, I, I hear from a, lo- a fair amount all the time from whenever I whenever I'm on podcasts and stuff. Uh, I get a lot of people, you know, thanking me for, you know, talking about my struggles and 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 for my vulnerability and for talking about things that a lot of people don't talk about. Um, I do, uh, I actually do, I have a lot of material on when I was in the psych ward that has not hit the, hit the mainstream yet that I think is my funniest. Oh good, I can't wait to hear some psych ward stuff. When I do that on stage, it's, um, it's my favorite because the audience will completely go quiet and you can feel the way the audience just all of a sudden loosens up but tightens at the same time and they just are completely engaged and they're just staring and just listening because they're just so intrigued and it's just something that they want to know about. It's like voyeurism. It's fun. It's fun because they're like, they want to hear about it. And there's always someone there. Sometimes I say, who here has been to the psych ward? And there's, it's without a doubt, it's a pretty blonde girl who raises her hand. Right. Every time. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I heard you say uh, on another podcast is you're talking about how like you went to a meeting and you killed at the meeting and then you tried the material like doing stand up and it bombed. I don't I've done stand up twice. Like mm-hmm. I'm very jealous of stand ups. I can't stay up late. Like I go to bed at ten. I never I never thought like a stand up. I never like had jokes, but in my head I'm like, I could do stand up. One time I was really good and one time I was not really good. And I actually went to that laughing Buddha place that I heard you talk oh, about. God. <laughs> well, that's as far as I went. One night I was really good and one night I wasn't good. What's the difference between like a room, like a meeting, and a, and a and a room. Like, can you use meetings as warm ups? Open mics. Yeah. No. The answer is no. I mean, but do you do it anyway? I mean, no. I mean, sometimes you can you can hear stuff that you that you think is funny. I mean, I've always wanted to try to transfer what I, I always hear people say in meetings about how, you know, they just want to learn how to smoke crack like a gentleman. Right. So I always wanted to try to figure out a bit where I'm just trying to look for a man who can smoke crack like a gentleman. I think that's a good bit. Yeah. And I I do remember sharing in a meeting talking about how, like, how much I miss um, drunk driving how fun it was. And I do have a, a joke where I say, people say, oh, Chloe, what do you miss the most about drinking? And I'm just like, driving. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, and what do you miss about drunk driving? In, in all honesty. Um, I, I just like The freedom the of freedom. driving intoxicated? Mm-hmm. The, the adventure? Uh, the death-defying kind of thing? It's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm a city person. I guess I drove a lot on heroin in Los Angeles. And I crashed a bunch of cars and nobody got hurt. It was yeah. very fortunate. So like growing up here, like I didn't drive, I didn't use and drive, but in California I didn't drive without being fucked up, mm-hmm. but I was never drunk. But driving on heroin is probably worse than drunk driving. I have a friend, there's this bar in New York. You never heard of the frying pan? Yes. It's this, it's this bar in, uh, where is that? I don't know downtown. Downtown, place. and it's a it's a boat where there's a bar. And oh no no yeah it's yeah. on it's on the water. Uh, on it, the it's, water yeah I was there. It's, it's called the frying pan where all you know twenty twenty three year olds go and get super fucked up in the daytime. And one of my friends was drove there for some reason, and everyone <laughs> got in the car, and people were all in like Molly and stuff. And she got pulled over, and she got a DUI leaving the frying pan, and got put in like Chelsea jail. That seems classic. <laughs> so I, stupid. I went to the frying pan in sobriety on a double date, and everyone got smashed. Um, now, oh my god! And I remember this also. One of my friends was so wasted, and she was like walking out of the frying pan, and then she's yelling and. She goes, I was just hit by a car. I was hit by a car. And we were like, um, that car is parked. And so we're all making fun <laughs> of her. And we're like, yeah. Um, she hit a parked car. We're like, you just got hit by a parked car. <laughs> now, she, Chloe just came in. And I was ready to do our usual dopey shtick. And Chloe looks like she's going to die to come on the show. Like, not excited. But, like, coming on the show might kill her. And we start talking. 
And Chloe has had a series of relapse. Yes. You know, and like, there's no shame in it. Like, it's, it's like you go to an AA meeting and everybody in there has their first day back at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everybody does. So like, I just want to start there. I don't want it to like drop in the middle of this story. Um, What's the longest amount of time you ever put together? Nine months. When did you get them? I got that um, after Mountainside. Yeah, and that's another thing. Chloe went to Mountainside. Yeah. Mountainside hosted our first ever Dopey convention. Really? DopeyCon was at Mountainside in Manhattan. I love that. Yeah, when we do DopeyCon 3, you have to come. I'd love to. Because you're a Mountainside alum. They won't stop fucking email. I know, me. I know. They're like, do you want to come pet sheep? I didn't know that fucking... I'm like, yeah, if I could take Xanax, I'll pet a sheep. <laughs> Wait, so when you were there, did they have equine therapy? No. Did they have sheep? No. So where are they inviting you to pet sheep? They just email. They're always random. And now they've opened tons of everything there. What we had to do was, I remember at Mountainside, they made us go. I went in February, and we had to go camping in the winter time. I, this one girl, you know how when you go to rehab, the first thing you do is you get a best friend. Sure. And then by the end of it, you're like, I fucking hate this girl. Well, that, that, that I always try to maintain it like it's a friendship. Oh, God. At the beginning, you're like, we are going to be best friends. Can we switch? Can we be roommates? We do everything together. We're codependent. I love you. And by like the week three, I'm like, I hate this girl. You know, and you pretend like you're best friends forever, and then you keep in touch, and then you're like, ah, uh, can you not? What was the end of you and this friendship? Okay, the end of it was they made me do my chore at Mountainside was like washing dishes. Sure. And then we went. I washed dishes at Mountainside. And then we went on the camping trip in the winter. What did they call the tramp camping? It was like a thing. I don't know. I owe some. I don't know. I didn't do it, but keep going. And uh, we had to go camp in February, and then she volunteered me to be the dishwasher because she was like, Chloe loves washing dishes as her chore. And I was like, I lost it. I was like, You think I like fucking washing dishes? And you think I want to do it up here? You think you know me? <laughs> And I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I ran away from the camping yeah. trip. And they're like, you can't run away. I'm like, I'm out of here. And then I ran away from the camping trip. And Where did you wind up? I just ran back down the hill. Wait, that was it. Yeah. You were like, got into bed. That was it. Yeah. Um, and you put together eight months, nine mm-hmm. months, eight yeah. and a half months, something like something that. Something like that. And what did you do then? That, that What changed? What happened? What was the relapse? Well, what happened was I moved from there I went to sober living in San Francisco. Wow. Because my boyfriend m- lived in San Francisco. Um, so I went to San Francisco and I was 26. That was the first time I got sober. I found Mountainside actually because I was watching the Kardashians and Scott Disick went there. I, I didn't know that until I heard you say it. That probably means I can get him on the show, right? It probably, I don't know. I, I think that would be a big deal for I was the- just like, ooh. I was like, oh my God. I was like, Scott's here. I was like, because when you watch a TV show and you're like, I could do that. I was like, I could fucking do that. And so I went. Um, but I was in a really dark place. And um, What year did you go there? I went there in uh, 2015. Okay. I was there in 2011. Okay. Um, it was funny because at the treatment center I was just at, I was just at Seafield Center out in West Hampton, the Bad Hampton. That's the that's the the Bad Hampton. The Bad Hampton. Why? Cause it's just it's the shitty Hampton. That's the poor Hampton. Uh-huh. Okay. It's the only time I hope to live in West Hampton. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, so I was just out there for a month ugh, in the winter, and um, I. Uh, Oh, yeah, there's some kid online for his uh, getting his subs. And I would always just sit in the subs chair because I just wanted to socialize with the boys. And uh, everyone's like, here for subs. And I was like, I'm not sure. Someone wants to give me some. <laughs> Did you take Suboxone no. either? No, but I mean, I've taken Suboxone for fun. It wasn't that fun. So you left Mountainside. You go to Sober Living in San Francisco to be with this dude. And what, what happened? I would sneak out of my Sober Living like every night and go to his house. And um, Was he using or anything? He, was a, he would just drink. He was like a normie, like very preppy guy who just drank and... Um, he was so in love with me, and I was just such a monster. And then I then I hated that sober living. I think I got kicked out because I would sneak out a lot. And then I left there, and I went to a different sober living in Marin. Nice. Yeah. Or, yeah. And then at that sober living, all I did was watch 
Game of Thrones with the house mom who had no teeth. And that sounds amazing. Yeah, she had no teeth and was just constantly vaping, and we just watched Game of Thrones. And then in there, there was this out the pool, and then this like older woman who would wear a wig, and she would just pee in buckets next to the pool, so wow. the whole pool smelled like urine. But she didn't pee in the pool. And then there was this other girl there who got who was addicted to meth because her mom used to be like Willie Nelson's assistant. So she got addicted to meth with her mom hanging out with Willie Nelson. And she was a kleptomaniac and she had stolen like everything from her rehab. So she had like suitcases full of like huge like candles and like like the coffee table books and like lanterns and like all these like gold ornaments. And she's like, yeah, my sponsor says I have to mail these back. <laughs> and it was just like a hundred pound suitcase of all these things, but she had like fully decorated a room. There were like massive candlesticks and one was like a chandelier. And I'm like, what the fuck? Also, we were like, we'd also be like, let's find God. So we, one day we were like, found this church she's like i found this great church we're gonna go to find god because we're like we have to find god god is so chic right so we found this church and we go to this church and it's like one of those mega churches and we go in and we're like perfect we're gonna totally because i was obsessed with this time at like trying to find my like um like what is it like your god experience or your your uh your uh spiritual awakening your spiritual awakening yes is that what it is? Yes. Your white light experience. I don't know. But you know Bill W. was on like psychedelics yeah. when he had his white light experience. So like sometimes I'd be in bed and I would see like, I would hear like a noise. I'd be like, mm, that was it. <laughs> and then my friend would be like, oh, no, it no, doesn't that, count. That was a garbage truck uh, <laughs> coming to pick up yeah, or something like that. Um, Do you think that the cynicism of being a stand-up comic interferes with your ability to have a spiritual awakening? No, I think it interferes with my sobriety. How? Because um, I'll tell crazy stories about like partying and getting fucked up, and then I will get validation from it on stage, and I'll think it's funny, so I'll keep going with it. It is funny, except that you're like it makes you miserable. Where did it? Where did it go from there? You're in fucking sober living, San Francisco, to Marin with the kleptomaniac seeking God in we, the mega church. We, we go to this mega church though, and we walk in. We're like the newcomers, and everyone's like this total cult, and everyone's like, "Welcome, Chloe," and I think Emily or something. And we're like, "Hi," and they like give us like these necklaces, and they were like wow this is amazing they're like our special guests and they have us like sit up front and then they start doing this like sermon and there had just been that like gay shooting in miami and they start talking about how all the gays will go to hell and we're just like uh this is not the spiritual awakening we were hoping for i think for. we're at the wrong church right. and we're like trying to leave but we like can't leave because like we're the special guests and we're like trying to walk out and they're like where are you going you must stay <laughs> we're like oh my god we are at the wrong fucking church did you get out of there i mean we like you stuck it out we had we didn't we couldn't go they were like blocking the doors because we were like the guests and we were like this is not the spiritual awakening we had in mind. No, they wanted the homophobic like awakening. It no. was like the real. It was like this. We're like, okay, that that backfired. Right. Well, so then what happened though? So I want to. I want to know. Can I say I tell that story on this podcast? You can tell any story. Okay. Why? Why, why couldn't you? I don't. know. Oh, because of my trans voice. Yeah. No, we'll be all right. You can tell any story. Anyway, nothing's off limits. I want to get to. The, I mean, like, we're talking about, like, your experience is kind of everybody's experience. Yeah. Except for the people that never relapsed, which, you know, fuck them. We're alcoholics. It's our natural state. It, it, it happens. I remember, like, sitting in meetings sometimes being, like, always day counting and, and seeing everyone with all these years. And I'm, I'm always counting days. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, am I the only one doing this right? Why is nobody else getting fucked up? Everyone here says they're an alcoholic and an addict, but I'm the only one fucking doing it. <laughs> right? But when does it when does it backfire on yourself? All the time. I'm miserable. I'm so depressed. I I it, it, uh, I feel like such a slave to the disease. Um 
it sucks. I mean, I went and I got a Vivitrol shot yesterday and I've just been, it, it's such an ordeal to get this shot. I got one in treatment and then trying to get one when I was out. I'm going through these two outpatient centers there. Oh, we're ordering it. We're ordering it. And, um, they couldn't get it. So I went and I ended up finding a place myself to get it and then they had to order it. And I finally got it yesterday and I, I totally used that as an excuse to, to kind of run with it. And, um, I was just praying. I was just like, oh, I hope I can get it today. I hope I can get it today. And then I go in there and they're like, we forgot whoever wrote you in forgot to give it to you. And they're like, actually, luckily the guy who was supposed to get your shot decided he's not coming here anymore so we're gonna switch the thing and you can get your shot and well, i was just like thank fucking god now i have this and i don't have to use when did you had you ever gotten a vivitrol shot before yeah I, it was the first time i got one was this time around in treatment um because i never wanted one because a part of me was like i i want it i, I don't you know there's always there's always this part of me that you know, wants to be able to have the option. Yeah, of course. I, I once had to do a, like a long time ago, like on the back of the village voice, they would say healthy heroin addicts wanted to participate in a study and you get paid. Yeah. And they would do this study up in Washington Heights. Okay. And it was like the first now track zone study. Okay. And you kind of leave there and they're like, you're going to get a shot, but you don't know if you're going to get the 30 day dose of now track zone the day dose of naltrexone or the placebo. Mm. So I went home from the study and shot dope immediately. And then I kind of shot dope every week until the naltrexone wore off. Cause I didn't even, I wasn't ready to be blocked Yeah. before this shot. Like you didn't want to be, and, and you're not a heroin addict. You, you, well, you got it blocked for the drinking. Yes. And I have a close friend who started taking naltrexone on a daily basis for the drinking. Yeah. Did you ever do that? I did that. Um, I did that. I mean, last, this past March, last March, see, in college, I liked, I, I, try, I went to, when I went to college in Texas, every, Oxys, people really liked Oxys there. And, and I, 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 I fucked around with them, but I, I was one of those people who would, I would get really sick. Like, I would just throw up. Uh, sick from getting high? No, I just, I just, was like uh, I think some people just get like allergic. I was like kind of like allergic to them. No, you would get high on on fucking oxys or an opiate, and you'd vomit immediately. Yeah, yeah. immediately. Yeah, that's like, how that's what happened to me the first time. Or the first time I did heroin. So I just didn't really like them because I was just like I would just get so nauseous like when I would take it, and it was just like not fun for me. Like I didn't enjoy it ever. Right. I mean, it's brain chemistry, and it's the way things hit you. But what you just said really caught my attention where you said, I'm miserable, I'm depressed, coming out of like telling this colossally funny story. It's like, how do you weigh those two things against each other? And how much does comedy cover the depression? Mm -hmm. How much does it help with it? Like, what does it do? Uh, Especially like you're fucking three. Chloe's very brave. She's three days out of, uh, of drinking. She just had the shot and she's coming on the world's greatest podcast. The world's greatest. Yes. And so like, how does that all add up in your head? Like you're coming on this. I mean, I didn't like that she called it a recovery podcast. I'm sorry. I think it's like the Joe Rogan of recovery podcast. Yeah. And I want, um, and I think that's brave. Like, cause like people out there right now, some are clean, some are dirty, mm -hmm. some are in and out and your story is incredibly relevant. So, you know, when you're sitting and talking to me or to this mic, you're talking to that community. Like, does that fuck with you at all? No, because I know that at the end of the day, I'm just like a person and this is my struggle. And I, I, I don't know. I, I just, with me, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know how long I'm going to be sober. I don't know when I'm going to pick up. I don't know when I'm not going to pick up. I, I, and I just have to keep going um, because I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, it's like it's a lot of people are saying you said you were saying you got sober for your child or one. Of I, I got sober because I couldn't deal with being such a fucking piece of shit parent. Yeah. Type of thing. And I honestly, like at this point, like I'm, I mean, I'm not even very good necessarily. I don't have much of a career to my, to my standards, but I, I love comedy. I love doing stand up. It's what 
makes me happy and that's the reason I keep going. So it's like I I just I want to perform and I have this I have this thing in me that keeps going and I I don't know if it's I have this stamina that I just I keep trying and it, that is something that I should be proud of that I will wake up every day miserable or not and I will try. Um You will be proud of it. You're just not proud of it at this moment. You no, will, I am proud of it that okay, I woke good. up and I got here. You I did mean, because this is work. I'm working. All right. I'm working and I enjoy this. It's very low paying work. Yeah. Very, she didn't even take a cup of coffee from me. Very low pay. She brought her own coffee, yeah. which I like. That yeah, makes it, it easier for me. It's like my third cup. Today. I, I did buy sweet and salty trail mix if you have a hankering. It's here for you. That's good because you're like, I don't know what she wants. I don't know if she's sober. I don't know if she's not. I, I you know, I don't make assumptions, but um, I appreciate like, where you're coming from and you're talking about like i guess the first thing i want to know is like i also love that you're passionate about it like mm -hmm. i'm really passionate about making the show yeah i'm passionate about like i'm passionate about my recovery and i'm passionate about doing this show and making this show bigger and better and i know it's exactly the same thing it's just like not stopping it's like what you said we can't get there if we stop so it's like the truth for your career. Uh -huh. It's the truth for Dopey. It's the truth for my recovery. It's the truth for your recovery. When you are at the lowest feeling like shit and you have to get on stage and make people laugh, does it fuck you up or does it help you? Um, wait, sorry. Can you repeat that? Okay. When you're feeling down, right? Yeah. Shitty. You hate yourself or depressed. Oh, going on stage? It does, does it that, does it fuck you up or does no, it help you? Never, uh -huh. never. No, it it it, it, so, it sounds kind of cheesy, but um, when I'm upset or anxious, the only the time I feel most at peace and zero anxiety is on stage. That's when I am the most happy. That is when I'm the most at peace and I have zero anxiety. For me, being on stage because you have to be completely present. Right. That is when I am the happiest or not even happy in it, happiest. I guess you are technically the happiest when you are in the present. No You're matter, gone. No You're not the there. Circumstances. So that's when I am, that's when I have no anxiety when I am on stage, even if I'm bombing. It's, I just am, or sometimes when you're bombing, you actually leave the present because you're like, get aware of it. But that's when I am the most at peace because I'm living in the present because you're forced to acknowledge being in the moment. So that's what I enjoy the most. That's like my form of a Xanax is being on stage. So when I get to, so Jamie Kennedy, he's a comic. Sure. And he told me once, no matter how shitty you feel, how depressed you are, get on stage, no matter what. Always just get on stage. And I think about that. And so I just do that. Um, and I just go. Even when I'm in the worst mood, if I'm so tired, I'll go get a Red Bull and I go on stage and I feel better every single time. Same way they say, if you feel like shit, go to an AA meeting, you'll feel better after. It's the same way for me for comedy, no matter what. And if I'm drinking and I go on stage, I get in my head and I hate it. I hate performing fucked up. I can feel it. I feel not connecting with the audience. I feel off and I hate myself. How often did you do that? I used to do it all the time, but recently if I go on stage and I'm drinking, I know I'm drunk, I know I've had a drink, and I am just angry at myself right. because once you have lived any form of your potential in sobriety and you know that you can be better and you felt being better when you go to be worse, you, I hate myself for it and then you're not then you're out of your head then you're not then you're back in your mm -hmm. head because you're like fuck i fucked it's up this, it's the same way that after you're sober and then you relapse and you are hung over you're like what the fuck right right i knew this, this right. bullshit right 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 i hear you that's okay so like it's very much like taking action mm -hmm. like like doing comedy is just like it's happening. It's like I'm out of my head. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hate myself. I don't have to double think anything. And like how much do you prepare for it? Like do you memorize your set? Yeah, I know my set. But I, I, I mean I mix it up. And then sometimes when I, if I'm drunk I'll stumble. I start, I'll, won't do my jokes. I'll just talk to the crowd the whole time. Right, right. 
I, when I when I it doesn't I mean my illustrious comedy career. Yes, of course. I don't want to compare it with your actual comedy career. First time I did it, I had a story about detox in L.A. Uh-huh. and I was drinking and I was smoking pot when I went on stage, but I wasn't on dope and I said that and everyone thought that was really funny. Yeah. And then I told my stupid story of detoxing in LA, like this dumb story. And then I had a, a note that my, I had a cleaning lady at the time and she wrote it on this giant piece of paper like that she was tired of cleaning up used condoms and stuff in my mm-hmm. house. So I read this note and it was like this great six minutes. And I was what like, What a oh. hero using condoms. Yeah. I was like, I'm a comedian now, you know? And then I went back and I tried to just talk to the crowd and it wasn't funny <laughs> at all. But, um, I was a waiter, and I thought that I was so funny waiting tables that I could do stand-up. But um, when did you start drinking? Like, when did you know you were an alcoholic? Um, I started drinking when I was young. Like, I don't know, 13? Not that young, I guess. I don't know. That's young. My daughter's 11, and it's like the idea of her fucking drinking now. It's yeah. like, oh, God. I mean, and then I was really into cocaine when I was 15, 16. So how does that happen? Uh, just I was in New York. I went to boarding school. got really into blow. I was doing coke in the morning before class. When is the first time you did coke? 15. But like, lay it out for me. Like how a 15 year old is doing coke. Um, I was, I think one of my older siblings or something, or one of my older, someone's friend left their phone on a table and me and some of my friends were like, took their phone and we saw in it like one of their we saw a number that said like white and we just wrote the number down and called it we're like can we get some uh, white and the guy like met us and we just bought some blow and that was in manhattan or at boarding in school manhattan. okay because we used to come to the city on the weekends and um and then i remember i did coke and i was like this is fucking dope i mean not dope this is I get coke it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> this is not dope this is coke i get it um and then yeah, I just really enjoyed it. But then when I was 16, I had, I did a, so much cocaine at Marquee, that nightclub, and I had a seizure. And they, um, the police came, and I had to go in an ambulance, and it was in front of, like, everyone from my school. And I was, like, bleeding, and it was just, like... You bit your tongue or your lip? Bit my tongue really yeah. bad, and it was, like really like humiliating because everyone was like chloe's a drug addict all the parents were like stay away from chloe she's a drug addict and then i kind of just felt like that was my reputation so i just rolled with it were you on benzos then too uh no so that was just the the epilepsy showing itself from the coke uh yeah but i also had like i remember i had a, a bag that was just literally an eight ball and i just like just did it in a sitting like in the bathroom i just put a straw and just like now, when you say that people were like, oh, she's a, a druggie or she's a coke hat or whatever, do you remember like being like, okay, they think this of me, so I'm going to be like that? Or do you think that's just the way you tell yourself the story now? Um, that's how I thought. I was a lot ashamed. I went to a very elitist school. And um, I remember like one time being in a car with one of my friends and the mom, and the mom was kind of drunk, and she was like, why are you even hanging out with Chloe? Last time she was seen, she was doing cocaine at nightclubs, being a fuck up. And I was just like, I was like 15 or 16. And I was like, oh. That doesn't feel good. And then everyone from my school is going to Yale and Harvard. And I'm just like, here we go. Going to Texas. And then I just like went to school in Texas. And then in Texas, I was like, everyone thought I was so cool because I was from New York. And then I started selling coke. And that's when I got really into Xanax. And I had this friend who was doing heroin and, tried to buy heroin from him but then he got kicked out thank god i didn't get into that and then i was doing oxys for a little but then i kept getting sick so i stopped and then i i was doing a lot of xanax like i would eat like I was eating like six bars a day. I was I was like that too. So, but then I was doing that and just sleeping for days and days. But then I started having um, seizures after seizures from that. Um, Do you remember any any particularly funny seizure stories? For some reason, I think seizure stories are funny, but I, I think there's something any, wrong. I with don't me. have any funny seizure stories because mine were always like, um, you know, mine were always like just like be standing somewhere and then all of a sudden. Um, 
hit my head, be covered in blood, wake up with policemen around me, and then be in a hospital. Like, yeah, mine were never funny. I don't know why I think that's hilarious. Yeah, but there's but something wrong with me. They weren't funny for me, particularly. When, when, you had, when I had seizures, right, I would wake up. Like, I had, I've had so many seizures. I had a seizure on a plane flying for work, <laughs> and it was before the, the plane took off, and I had the seizure. And the next thing I know, I'm on the gurney, getting taken off the plane. I was like, what? I just fell asleep. I, I didn't have, and I, that's how I, all my seizures were. Like, I just felt like I passed out. Like, yeah. do you remember how it felt to have seizures? Did it feel like that for you? I didn't feel them coming, but like one time I bit through my whole cheek and it wow, was stabs right. all on the side. Um, like it was just, mine just weren't fun. Mine weren't fun either, but for some reason they just seemed so like, I don't even know how to say it. They seemed like monumental, like something had happened. And and I mean, I remember it took me a long time to stop doing benzos. I didn't stop doing benzos forever. And I would have seizures, you know, I would eat, you know, many pills, yeah, yeah, yeah. many clonopins, many Xanax. And every time I would stop, I would have a seizure yeah. in some fucking horrible situation. Well, because I would stop taking the Xanax and then I'd be like, I just missed two weeks of school. And so I would take like a fuckload of Adderall and then have a seizure. Right. This one kid I remember at SMU, he was, took, was taking so many bars and then he was in his academic advising meeting and he had a seizure. <laughs> in the meeting. <laughs> Trying to sign up for classes. <laughs> There's a funny one. Right. I remember like, but Xanax stories, like I remember one night on sp like going to spring break and the next time on spring break and I was like, honestly, last night was the most fun night I've ever had at school. <laughs> and then like two days later, someone's like, do you even know what you did? And I was like, what? I had the best night of my life. They're like, you went into, I was like a freshman. They're like, you went into a senior's house, took soy sauce, a jar of soy sauce that you stole from the restaurant, threw it all over the walls and ripped down their curtains and shattered a glass and told them that, this one's for all the 18 year olds in the world. <laughs> you were like and a, then ran out. You were a revolutionary. <laughs> they were like, what the fuck? Did you remember any of it? No. no. So why did you think it was the best money? I don't know. Because you were taking the stand. I don't know. I was like, honestly, I had the best time. Of, I thought that all we did was like go out to dinner and like go to bed. I was like, what a chill night. I was like, because I had thought like I'd had, I was crazy. And I was like, I just love Xanax. I'm so chill. I loved Xanax and I, I, we called it relaxo. And that was like when I was coming off of heroin, I would think it was, it was chill to do Xanax as opposed to shoot heroin. You could just take a couple of Xanax. I kept doing these things that I kept saying were for the 18 year olds in the world. Like this one time I got a citizen's arrest and I, I, when I got a, I got a citizen's arrest in Vail and when I got arrested, I also, when I was in jail, I was yelling, this one's for the 18 year olds in the world. And it's like, what, who did I think I was? I like that. It's like a power to the people kind of thing. <laughs> I like, think that's awesome. When you were getting fucked up in New York before college and you were in the kind of like debutante fucking oh, scene, yeah. what was that like? Fun. Right. I thought I was like, I don't know who I thought I was. Like, uh, like that was the Lindsay I was Lohan like a socialite, age. I thought, yeah, I would you see, were a socialite. I, I would though, see Lindsay you? Lohan at like I would go to Bungalow Eight all the time, and Lindsay Lohan would be there. So like I, like, I remember one time at Butter, this club, I fell down the stairs and I fell into like Devin Aoki's uh, uh, table. She was with Derek Jeter, and I fell backwards into their table and knocked it all. <laughs> Offer and like one of them picked me up and they're like, is she okay? And I was like, I'm fucking fabulous. <laughs> so like, what's the trans? Because at that point, it's like, is drug addiction on the radar or no. is it just fun? No, it's just fun. Um, I remember we used to like go to like clubs and we like would never wait in line and. I used to joke like the only lines I do are up my nose. Yeah, that's classic, classic New York City socialite business. Right. But so like, when did it, when did it be like fuck? This is a thing. When I got, it was when I, after, it was when I started having my seizures, they started, right. it started to be more of a problem. But like, I remember having my seizure when I was 16 and they were like, you really shouldn't do cocaine, but they didn't diagnose me with epilepsy yet. They didn't know. And, um, well, they didn't know for a long time, right? No. And then, um, I guess I'm repeating some stuff I've said on other podcasts, which is fine because it's different listeners. I'm not worried. Um, and, but I, um, e yeah, so that at that point, it was just like, after I had that seizure, um, I did coke the next day. 
because I just I didn't care. Um, was was becoming a coke dealer in Texas like oh, that was so stupid? Was that changing the world like your like perception of your drug addict career or like it was like it was not like I was a real coke dealer, but I remember my coke dealer he got murdered. So, so like, how not real a Coke dealer were you or how real a Coke dealer were not you? Not a real one. I only dealt Coke for, like, two weeks. Okay. <laughs> you had a, you had a, okay. There was this huge party at SMU called Casino. Playboy mm-hmm. Playboy named it, like, um, number one college party. Okay. And I bought, like, a... Is I, that why you went to SMU? Because it was some, like... It was a big party school. Right. I, it's the only one I got into. Um, but it was, like, uh, yeah, that school was fun. But um, it was fun until it wasn't. And, um, yeah, I mean, I was just like, it was, it is what it was. I think that SMU was, like, terrible for my drinking. And, um, but I think it was inevitable that I was going to be an alcoholic. But then when I got back to New York, I was, I was living at my parents' apartment. And I went to the school in Marymount, Manhattan. And I didn't have that many friends in New York. I had some friends who were older who had graduated. And I would just, like, go and get, like... I would just get fucked up every single night. And I went to my first AA meeting when I was 21. And um, I was just, like, going to, like, Dorian's every night. And then go to, like, the clubs, like, every night. And um, I remember I broke my leg on a trampoline. And I would go out with a... I would go out with crutches to like clubs and I would, I remember I used to like lay on the dance floor and take my crutch and like just hit everyone's ankles and think it was so funny. And why did you get kicked out of school? Um, I got arrested two times for dealing Coke. No, for what? I got arrested for like underage drinking at tailgates and then I had a warrant and then I got arrested again for, I don't remember why, but, um, one time when I got arrested there, (laughs) <laughs> the, they were like I, you have to have these bands to drink when you're like over 21 at the tailgates at SMU everybody gets arrested there and the cop saw me with a beer Hightower he remembered me my little brother went there like 10 years later and they saw his name was LaBranch and he was like is your sister Chloe wow you still remember you made me. an impact and um, uh, the guy was like put that down the cop was like you better put that down and I was like uh uh-uh. he's like you better put that down I was like you're like, this is for 18 year olds mm-hmm. everywhere. And I, I used to do this thing where I would wolf bite the beers right. for shotgunning. Wow. So I just go, I go, oh, I'm gonna put it down. So I just wolf bit the beer and I shotgunned it. I was like, fuck the system. <laughs> I threw it down and then they just come and they handcuff me. And I was on so much Xanax too before the day party, before the whatever tailgate. And they are handcuffing me and I remember I was screaming uh, when they're handcuffing me Indian burn he's giving me an Indian burn and then and then I'm yelling in the in the cop car I'm like he's he tried to finger me no. he tried to <laughs> finger me and then they had it on the transcript and they had to read the transcript to my dad and the lawyer that. Chloe screamed, they are trying to finger me. They're fingering me. This is for the 18-year-olds everywhere. Now, what did your dad and do? And I remember when they were giving me the, um, they did fingerprint me, and I kept going middle finger the whole time. Right. And they're just like, stop. <laughs> Was your dad scared they, like, were fingering no, you? My, no, he's just like, what the fuck, Chloe? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, you'd just be like, go to the gym. Get yourself together. No. But, um... There were just like so many, everyone was getting arrested at SMU all the time because they had so many on-campus deaths there because it was such a crazy party school. And at that time already, um, kids were dying of fentanyl because these kids were um, selling fentanyl patches and fentanyl lollipops. So it was just already... The beginning. The beginning. That was in 2009. Yeah. So, um, and like two girls had gotten murdered by their Coke dealers there. It was like a pretty wild place. They called it a farmy school. Like pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And I remember these, there was a lot of money in that school. And I remember these kids would um, charter a plane and go pick up oxys and bring them back. And so you, you, you strike me as like the high octane party kind of addict and not like the psychedelic taking fucking. Oh, I fucking love So what was that. it? What was that? What was acid that Acid is my best drug. Okay. I, I'm, acid is like the only drug I think I'm good at. You're back. You're going to do acid next week just to right? see, see if it gives you the spiritual awakening that you've Sir, been seeking. I heard that uh, they have an ayahuasca ceremony now for epileptics. I think they have 
They, I think they do. I think they have ayahuasca for everybody now. I heard that people in AA are doing ayahuasca. Sober people. It's not like promoted, but I, I, I hear about people who are in AA that, that do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I love acid. I fucking love taking acid. Mushrooms, not so much. But acid, whew, it's one of my favorite drugs. Do you have any good psychedelic stories? Um... Don't we can come back to that. No. Let me let me ask you, like, when does the comedy Oh yeah, I do have a funny one. All right. So I remember one time I was <laughs> I was at uh I went to this rave in Brooklyn and it was like a two thousand person rave on Halloween and I was dressed up as this like super slutty cat and we took a bunch of acid and um <laughs> made out with this like twenty two year old. I was like 29 or something nice. this guy from france and he had never he had never done acid so i just like gave him some and then he was like oh can i get your number and instead i just like wrote down my address and gave him my address i'm like here's this it's even better <laughs> and he's like, okay he's like okay psycho but he didn't he didn't come over i honestly have no idea it was like it could be a seamless guy it could be francois right we never know we never know <laughs> Could be a delivery. <laughs> so when? So but but wait. So I took all this acid and I then I lost my friends and there was like no service there and I start like crying. But you know when you cry on acid and it just feels like there's waterfalls because you can't feel the tears and it just like feels like there's waterfalls and it just says this like slutty slutty cat. And I'm like <laughs> I lost everyone and it's just like I'm just like also has anyone seen my dad? <laughs> Amazing. And I'm like hysterically crying. I eventually like find my friends and my two friends were dressed as the Joker. And I see them and I'm like, I don't want to see them actually. And then we go back to one of my friends' houses and um, we're just like doing like tons and tons of nitrous. But like every time I do nitrous, I have a seizure, which is annoying because I love nitrous. So annoying. I it's love nitrous so too. annoying. And so I do nitrous, I have a seizure. And I'm like, Ugh, just like a little one. And then so I'm like, I'm going to try it again. So then I do nitrous again, and I have a seizure, and then I just start hysterically crying. And I'm just like, God took away the one thing I love, nitrous. Like, he's so mean. Like, I loved it. And my friend looks at me, and she goes, Chloe, like, you actually have problems. You are on so much acid, and you are hysterically crying that you can't do nitrous. Here, hold on. That was my, my dad's famous... <clears throat> He used to have seven phones in the house. Like he would have, he, now he only has one phone in here, one phone in the other room and one phone in the other room. But he used to have two. So like when the phone rang on the podcast, it was like ridiculously loud. Now I love nitrous. I like, I beg for nitrous when I get like a teeth cleaning and stuff. Of course. So you can't have nitrous anymore? You're done? Uh, no, except for like, I did a bunch of nitrous when I went to see my friend because she was like, we have to watch a G2. Gremlins 2. And G, does anyone call Gremlins 2 G2? She does. And okay. she was like, if you watch G2, you have to be on nitrous and ketamine. Okay. She's like, it's the law. Did you do ketamine and nitrous? Yeah. <laughs> to watch G2. How much ketamine have you done? So much. Really? So much. There was uh, these, I was in, um, after I did these shows in, um, I was opening for a friend in, uh, where was it? Chicago and then I ended up staying after after my breakup and I stayed in Chicago because I'm this idiot and I decided to relapse and I stayed with the high school uh, was this the relapse after Mountainside no this was this last one last, this was the last relapse this was before I went to rehab again and um hold on hold on this was after you had like the eight months though no, no this is years later this is this fall Okay. Um, and then these, I was with these doctors and the doctors, they take, uh, they make ketamine and they put it in Flonase bottles. Nice. Yeah. It's insane. Well, we, we used to do heroin like that in the Afrin bottles, but so who puts yeah. it in the, who puts it in the, the doctors, they make it. It's for depression. Is yeah. that the ketamine depression treatment? I don't know, but it's really strong. Do they prescribe it to you? No, they were just doing it at the club. Okay. What do the doctors have to do with it? The doctors prescribe the ketamine. The doctors made it, and the doctors were partying with us. No way. Yeah. Oh, that's we were terrible. partying with the doctors. Very irresponsible mm -hmm. doctors. See, yeah. you don't think about doctors like that. They're not like, are you an alcoholic? Can you handle like a flonase of ketamine? And then I was like going to a K-hole, and they're like, you need Coke. And I was like, this is great, doctors. So they gave you Coke in the K-hole? Yeah. 
wow, this is serious business. Now, what I'm always curious about. I was about, just like slaying me on a DJ booth, too. You were, you were out behind the DJ booth. I was partying. Okay, you were in the DJ booth. <laughs> you were taking Flonay's hits of ketamine in the DJ booth. You go out and they like get some coke up her nose or did they shoot you with the coke? Uh, I know they put it on my nose. Have you ever shot coke? Uh-uh. You never shot anything? Uh-uh. Well, that's probably good. Yeah. That's probably a good thing. Probably. Um, how, I would just die of epilepsy. <laughs> when I, the thing that I'm always the most interested in and not necessarily for any good reason it's like the relapse after the time. Like, do you remember like the last time you had time and you were like, fuck it, I'm going to use it anyway? All the time. But what was the longest one? What was the most monumental? The most monumental was <clears throat> after those eight months, after the first time I went to treatment, I went on a Bumble date. And then after that Bumble date, I remember my friends were like, this is a really great guy. <laughs> don't mess it up uh -huh. and I said how could I ever mess this one up and let's just say I messed it up but what happened I don't really know um so we went on this date I remember I dressed like so slutty I looked like an Olsen twin like straight out of Auschwitz I was so thin and I dressed like an angel okay I was wearing this like tight like this tiny white white outfit and I was wearing like five inch heels and <clears throat> there was this guy who worked in M&A Mergers and acquisitions. Okay. And I was like, do you want to merge and acquire me? Nice. <laughs> and he took me to this like super fancy restaurant in the West Village. And it was his 30th birthday. So the whole thing was like super weird that he wanted to spend it with me. And so we like go out to dinner and he starts drinking like whiskey. And I'm like, same. And then. Did you have the thought? I had started drinking before the date my friend came over and I like had just started drinking. I drank like the day before it too. And then I started drinking and then my I was like, I'm really nervous, so I should probably take a Xanax. So I took a Xanax and I was like, I drank like a bottle of rosé or maybe two. And then I went to the date, started drinking whiskey. And then the next morning I wake up and the guy's like back is towards me. And like, I feel like if you ever wake up and a guy's back is towards you, you're like, Phew. Not a good sign. Yeah, it's a bad sign. Right. Like, why, why is it a bad sign? Because you're just like, oh, he's not, he's not hugging me. <laughs> right. And I wake up and he says to me, um, I was like, hey. And he's like, I got to go. Wow. And I'm like, why? He's like, got to get out of here. I'm like, yeah, let's get out of here. <laughs> Come on. And he's like, I'm leaving. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, what happened last night? And he goes, I don't want to talk about it. Wow. I'm like, can you just tell me? He's like, no, I told you I don't want to talk about it. And so I was like, fuck. So I had just like, I, I was just like, I am just so unwell. So I just, I called up and I, I had gone to mountainside in the winter. And I remember I said to myself, fuck that. If I'm going to go to rehab again, I'm not going to fucking Connecticut in the winter. I'm going to fucking Malibu. So I called up promises, Malibu. And I just, I got on a plane. How was that place? It was a joke. How so? I got kicked out after like two weeks, but I heard you tell a story about like some dude bringing in all sorts of drugs. Oh my God. Yes. So tell me that story. I want to hear that story. <clears throat> okay. and, then, and then we're going to deal with how we're going to, how you're going to not fuck up again. That That's going to be the, the Jewish guilt is going to come in the last segment <clears throat> of the show. But ha I want to hear the, the, I got to take a 23 and me so I can get some Jewish guilt. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so I, 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 I remember also when I got on that plane to Malibu, I was so drunk and <clears throat> I like drank, I was just like, I ordered like every single, single different drink on the plane. Cause I was like, it's gonna be my last, it's gonna be my last Budweiser. It's gonna be my last Bloody Mary. It's gonna be my last uh, gin and tonic, you know? And then I get to the airport and I go to the airport bar and I'm like, can I have a glass of rosé? And they're like, we don't have rosé. And I just started hysterically crying. I'm like, yeah, I don't have rosé. And then I get to um, the rehab. Um, first I went to Promises West LA, which is like the more ghetto one. And like, I found like a dope ball in my room. And I was just like, fuck this place. I'm out of here. I heard you describe this too. And I don't, I, I mean, like when I heard you say a dope ball, I imagine it's like a chunk of tar, but you described it as like a used cotton more thing. Yeah, that's what it was. And my roommate was like shooting dope. And she was like, oh, stop, don't, that's my dope ball. She, she just saved her cotton. Yeah, she saved her cotton. Right. So you were like, this is too ghetto for me. Take me to Malibu. And I was wearing just like a, a, a pink striped pajama set. Nice. The whole time, just like loaded up on my, uh, what Meds. was it? No, what did I take? I took um, 
phenobarbital. Yes. I loved phenobarbital. No one uses that anymore. I never liked it, but keep going. Anyways, so, uh, and then they're like, I remember I told them, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I want to go to the Malibu one, but I just need to go to a hotel for two days to think. <laughs> Did they say that's cool? No. No. They're no. like, absolutely not. So they put me in an Escalade, <clears throat> take me to Malibu. <clears throat> I get to Malibu. There's this girl sitting there with like, blue hair, blonde, like, I don't know, pink hair and like a Lakers jersey with an ankle bracelet, DUI bracelet. And she's just like, I'm like, who's hot? Tell me hot guy. She's like, there's going to be a guy here you're going to like. He's rich. <laughs> I'm like, perfect. And um, then this kid. Is that a real thing? Does that really happen uh, where you go up to this woman and say who's hot? Yeah. Because okay. I'm like, I need a boyfriend. Right. I need a boy rehab boyfriend. And at this point, like I had, I had all the wrong motives, you know, in, in getting sober. I was just like trying to, I would just wanted to keep running. In my idea, I had this idea of sobriety being glamorous and stupid, and I was just a fucking retard, sober. I just was a mess. I hated myself. I didn't know what was up, what was down. You know, I, um, so I was miserable though, but, you know, I had no concept of, of AA or what was the vision for sobriety? Or were you just like, I've been through it too many times, too many fucking horrible wake ups, too many like ridiculous situations. I just thought I was going to go to a treatment center and they were going to just fix me and right. I would leave. Right. I was just going to be just wasted when I got there, all fucked up. And then I would leave clear headed and then just have all the promises. Right. Well, that's what doesn't promise, promise that promises, <laughs> promise that promises. And then I go there, and then there's this guy who uh, his drug dealer, Bibba Dog, was calling him and being like, yo, I'm trying to send my kid to sleepaway camp, but I can't afford it because you're not buying blues. I can't go to camp unless you buy blues. So he's like, I just have to get his kid to camp. I have this. to support Baby Dog or it's not going to work out for him. So he got his dealer to throw a bunch of drugs over the hedge. And then before you know it, we're all fucked up on Xanax and Coke and whatever. And then... Um, How long does it last? Like that you're in this incredible period? Because that's the dream, right? When you're in rehab, the dream is somebody's going to have some dealer that throws everything in and all of a sudden rehab is not rehab. It's the place where we all get fucked up because all everybody wants to do is be fucked up together anyway. I know. So how long does that last? That's what I'm always like. You, at rehab, I remember at this last one, I was just like, they're like, they were they were so short staffed, and I was just like, I could ne they, you could never talk to a counselor. It was so short staffed, and I I was just like. Can I talk to a counselor? And they're like, talk to your peers. And I'm like, this person was like <laughs> fucking talking to a shadow person yesterday named Richard because she thinks <laughs> Richard stole her Jurassic Park DVD. We don't even have a fucking DVD player right, here. Right. Who wants to watch Jurassic Park, you know? She's walking around going, bingo, dino, DNA. I'm like, no, she's not going to help me. Right, right. Your peers aren't going to be the greatest hotbed of mental health no. kind of thing in that moment. So like... I want to know about it, though. Like, the drugs come in. The drugs come in. We're just, like, getting so fucked up. And then, you know, the, the staff didn't notice. How long did it last? Like, two, three days. Wow. And was it that, like, like the height of, like, like Roman orgy kind of thing? Like, where everybody... Is it a good time or is it not a good time? It was fun. I mean, they had, like, doctors prescribing us pills when we were in bed. I remember I was on sleeping pills and I said... I was on, like, a bunch of trazodone and I had said the day before, I was like, my sleeping pills aren't really working can you up mine? And the doctor came up to me when I was super coked out and he was like, hi, Chloe, like I want to talk to you about upping your sleeping pills. And I looked at him and I said, I'm never sleeping again. <laughs> and he's not like, I think I need you to pee right now. And he was like, okay, we'll take you off all of them. Well, but that's the thing. Like there's two ways to go to rehab, right? There's one way to go to rehab and want to use the second you leave, no matter what, mm -hmm. like, and you know, the second that you leave, you're going to use. Yeah. And the other way is like, can this work? What can I do to make this yeah. work? I don't want the drugs to come in over the hedge. I, I, I was at, at a rehab in, in California and, and heroin came over the side of the wall and I wound up doing it and I was blocked. And I had that terrible guilt and fear and freak out. Did you have any of that shit or was it just like, go, go, go? I mean, it was almost stupid because at every rehab, they're like, you're a love addict. And it was like, 
I didn't want to at first, but I really had a crush on this guy, and then I just wanted to like be a part of it, and then I also was just like, fuck it. Like, would they say you were a love addict, or was it just like, I need something? They would say I'm something. a love addict. But when I went to Mountainside, someone, people were on heroin there, and I had no interest in using I'm right. not a heroin addict, so. Um, but Did you always get in a rehab romance every time? No. I had a boyfriend at Mountainside, and I was so uninterested. Okay. I got into one at this last rehab. Seafield. Yeah. How did that go? Oh, my God. He's a, he smoked crack, so. In the treatment? No, at the, at the end. Did you ever smoke crack? Uh-uh. Why not? No, give it to me. No, give me this stuff. When's the last time you did coke? Uh... I don't know, a few months ago. Okay, so like... I mean, like last March, probably, I I started to fuck around with painkillers because I was at this guy's apartment and I was like hooking up with this guy and I went into his medicine cabinet and I just found a bunch of um, of hydros. Hydrocodone? Or, I guess, or, I don't fucking know. Yeah. Or, or, it's oxy. like Vicodin. You have some yeah. Vikes, I yeah. don't know. And I was like, oh, great. And I was on a bunch of mushrooms and drunk and... I was like, oh, this is great. And so I just started crushing them up and snorting them all. And then I went to the, then I went and hooked up with him. And then, uh, then I was like, oh, let's hang out tomorrow. And I went back and I just snorted the rest. And then, uh, <laughs> and I went back the next day and stole the rest of the bottle. And then I, I had borrowed his drill. Like his power drill? Yeah, for something. And then I remember. But hold on. What were you going to, what were you drilling? I had to drill like a shelf or something. Okay. And uh, I remember being like, I should call him to give his drill back. But also like, hmm, better not because I stole all his pill. Do you still have his drill? I threw it away. Why did you throw away the drill? Because we we're in a fight. <laughs> okay. So here we are. It's now fucking. Okay, wait. So yeah, we're at the rehab. I, whatever that happened, that happened. This guy ends up getting kicked out. I'm not getting kicked out. Wait, is this the crack smoker at Seafield or is this no, the love this of your life the and promises? the love of my life and promises. And I remember he's getting kicked out. He's on the sofa and he's so fucked up and we're all like down there like so upset. And and he's laying there like, like uh, and he's like, come sit next to me. And I'm like, no. And he looks at me like he's nodding out and he goes back and looks at me. He goes, beginning to lose interest <laughs> and then passes back out. And what did you do? Did you panic? I was like, oh my God. And... Then he gets kicked out, and so then I'm on, like, probation. They take away my cell phone, because we're allowed to have cell phones at this rehab. And then I'm not allowed to leave to go to, like, the outdoor, the outside AA meeting. This is, like, one of my craziest stories I'm going to tell you. And I'm not allowed to go to the outside AA meeting. And I tell, I, like, manipulate, obviously, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, to backtrack, when I left... The one in uh, the shitty one, the other promises, I was like, it's way cheaper, okay? So I went there, and then they're telling me I have to pay a fuck ton more money now because I'm going to the Malibu one. And my sweet mate is this guy who's like this kind of celebrity, super rich guy. And I tell him, and he goes, Chloe, <laughs> you got to go into the office, and you have to threaten them. Was it Scott Disick? No, 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 no. It was this like older, like kind of celebrity guy. And I go, really? He goes, go and threaten them. He goes, tell them that you are going to tell the New York Post that you found heroin in your room. And I was like, done. Wow. So I go in there and like my pajama set all fucked up on my detox pills. And I'm like, I'm not paying. I have a contact at the New York Post. <laughs> and I will have you written up in two seconds if you don't drop the price. And they just look at me. They go, here are promises. We do not respond kindly to threats. Please leave the office. And you were like, okay. And I go up to him and I'm like, that didn't, didn't work. work. And he's like, oh, huh, works for me. Right, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't sell it as well. Well, as well I'm not a celebrity. Right. So. But anyway, so, so uh, that guy gets kicked out. He's at a different fancier rehab. He's at a different rehab at Cliffside, Malibu, somewhere else. And I say to them, I say, if I say, I really need to go to the alumni promises, alumni meeting, which is like 150 people. Um, because if I don't go, I, I can't focus on my recovery. And they say, okay, Chloe, great for you for taking your recovery so seriously. You can come, but you're going to have a sober companion with you watching you. What was your motivation for wanting to go so bad? To just like get the fuck out of there. Okay. So to go find my man. Okay. So 
I don't have a phone. <clears throat> I don't have any money. I, I, I go to that meeting. <clears throat> I go outside to smoke a cigarette. I turn around. I see, like, I look when, like, no one's kind of looking. I run away from the meeting, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I run into Ralph's, which is, like, the grocery sure. store. yeah. And I steal a bottle of vodka. I go and I, like, chug the entire bottle of How vodka. How do you steal it? I just take it. and You I, put it behind your back? You I put it in your pants? What'd you do like that? in my... You know, All right. I was just like wearing like a crop top and, and, and cut off shorts or something. And somehow you fit the vodka in the shorts. I, don't All right. I like these kind of details. I was a psychopath. What do you want I, from me? I just, oh, I just, I went, it was like a, like a fifth like this. I just like shoved it down here and okay. I just walked out. All right. You they, know, when, when, you, when, when, you, when you want something, you, you can get, get it done. Something. Absolutely. I was like 90 pounds. Nothing fit me. I like thieving stories. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. the details of So thievers. I shove it in my pants. Yes. I have like, I'm like 90 pounds. I have like black eye makeup all over my face. My, I'm just like, I look like f- such a hot mess. Uh-huh. And I, I, get, I, I go and I like drink like the whole bottle of vodka basically. I come back to the meeting. I just walk in and I start screaming. And I'm like, fuck everybody in this fucking place. You think you know sobriety? I got fucking one day. Fuck this guy. Fuck you. You're a fucking bitch. (laughs) Like, it's like Jerry Maguire. Like, fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You're cool. Yeah. Like, whatever. They call the police. They call the ambulance. (laughs) They put me in like a... They call the police. They put me in an ambulance. Do you have any recollection? Like, not really. Not kind right. of in a okay. brownout. Who told you? Like, what did they say that you heard the story? I remember, like, like going in there and screaming. Right, right, right. Because right. I was, like, in and out of a brownout. I remember I went to the skate park and I was chugging it. Yeah. And, like, sitting with these, like, skateboarders. And being like, this is dope. And, like, trying to, like, <laughs> skateboard with them. And just, like, eating shit. Right. And they're like, what are you, who are you? I'm like, don't fucking worry. I'm on a mission. I was like, I'm from Promises, Malibu. Right. Um, I'm like, I'm going to get my man. And um, did you see him? Uh, no, <laughs> I almost did. Uh, uh, down the line at a different rehab that I ran away from, which is, <laughs> I got kicked out of this other rehab after that. I got kicked out of many more after this. But um, what was the string? How many did you do? Like eight. But so at, so after this, I get sent to this hospital, UCLA, and at that hospital, they told me that. I was, they put me in like five hospital gowns because I kept ripping off the hospital gowns and trying to like get naked. And I kept yelling like, where are the pills? And I was like, <laughs> right. do you have a pool? It's- where are the fucking pills? So then they let me out in the morning. I'm wearing my hospital gown. They have a plastic bag in it is just a pack of marble lights. And <clears throat> that's it. And like some papers. And I go down. This is like such a bottom in the bo- in the. In the UCLA AR, it's the pediatric cancer wing, too. And I'm using the phone over and over again, trying to call Promises Malibu. I'm getting the hotline. Nobody's answering for someone to pick me up. I'm like, I need a fucking drink. It's a Thursday, like 8 a.m. I walk out. I see, like, a restaurant. I try to break into a restaurant to, like, try to steal alcohol. Can't get in. I try to I look, walk around. Can't find anything. Across the street, I find the UCLA frat houses. Okay. So I go up to the SAE house and I went to SMU and I remember the password is like, you say Phi Alpha brother. Wow. So I knock on the door and I'm like Phi Alpha brother. And I'm in this like hospital gown with makeup and like dirty converses. And I was like good looking at the time, you know? And this guy answers the door and he's like, hi. And I'm like Phi Alpha. So he like lets me in and I'm like, I'm sure this was the greatest moment for this guy's life. And I'm like, they're like studying for a test. And I'm like, listen, I need a fucking drink. And the guy's like, all right. (laughs) And he's like, we only have beer. And I go, you don't have anything harder. And he goes, we had a big party last night. Um, a big jungle party. So like, we don't have any hard alcohol because like, we like, there's like a lot of hot girls here. So we like use all like the hard alcohol and like the hot girls. Like, I mean, sorry, I'm not saying you're like not hot. Like I would totally fuck you. I mean, sorry, <laughs> but like, um, I like whatever he goes, actually like, look at you. Like I, I won't judge you if you don't judge us. And right. I was like, fine. <laughs> so I like have like three beers with them and I get one of them to call me an Uber and they call me an Uber back to Malibu. So I get back to Malibu, my hospital gown, and I'm just like, fuck everybody here. And then they have to call me. Uh, we have to find another rehab for me. And they get, I get on a plane, 
go back to the East Coast. I go to this place in Connecticut. Which place? I go to, uh, where do I go? Where do I fucking go? I go to this place called High Watch Farm. Okay. I think I've heard of it. And I kicked out of there because I don't say gun in a rehab. You got kicked out of there for talking about guns in rehab? Yes. What would you say? I have a gun? I refused to eat the food there because I said it was disgusting. And okay. I said, I'd rather put a gun to my head than eat the food here. They don't kick you out for that. Yes. And they said, do you have a gun? And I said, mm, maybe. And then they had to call the police legally or something. So what was the <laughs> next stop on the tour? <laughs> so then I, from there, I went to uh, a sober house. And at the sober house, they had like a helipad. And my friend just like this heroin addict girl just like took all these nudes of me on this helipad. And we, wow. called, we called my rehab boyfriend that one. And he was at the Chateau Marmont doing a bunch of GHB with these like Playboy bunnies. And I was like, on coming. And I remember like I needed to get a bikini wax. Instead, I just like nared my whole vagina and butt. And I just like went out just got a rash <laughs> everywhere and i'm like trying to get on a plane and i'm like very uncomfortable but then there's like some massive storm in connecticut so i just checked into this hotel that was across the street from my boarding school and i just drank like martinis for three days and my co- high school advisor ended up coming there to the bar to the bar to the hotel where i was checked into like alone for three days just like throwing up in a shower did you call him or her um, one of my friends called her. So you never made it to the Chateau Marmont? No. Wow. And then from there, I came back to New York, and I went to uh, Williamsburg House. In Brooklyn? hmm And that was kind of the end of the colossal tour? Yeah. And what changed there? Um, I just got sober for, I got like six months. I just like stopped. There was like nothing really left. When did comedy come in? Comedy, I was, uh, I was doing comedy before this. When did it start? I was doing well. I was doing pretty well before all this. Uh, I started doing comedy in like 2013. Wow. And then, you know, I was doing well before all of this. And then I just, then when I had my eight months, I was doing great. And then I lost the plot. I just fucking went nuts. I, I lost. I when I was at Promises Malibu, I was out of my fucking mind. Yeah, it sounds like I a was glorious relapse. A lunatic. Yeah. Um, when does the psych ward come into the picture? Oh, I went. I went to the psych ward. At, okay, so after I got back from that um, place, after I got back from kicked out of that other rehab, then I went back to the city, and I went to that other sober living house. Then I got kicked out. Um, then, then I okay. Then I got back to the city. I went on an abuse. Oh, then I had another. When I got back to the city, I had a really bad seizure, and then I got diagnosed with epilepsy. Then I tried to kill myself. What was that? Um, then that was because I found out. Um, my boyfriend, the one that I really liked of the eight months or whatever, when we broke up, I was sober. He was still using. I had introduced him. He started hanging out with all of my friends. That right? was the Marmont guy or a different guy? No, that was the guy. San I went Francisco. To, I went to rehab for, right. for the first time. Um, he had started hanging out with all of my friends, and we had broken up, and I was still so in love with him. And this one girl I was friends with, um, uh, I was like, are you hooking up with her? And he was like, no, no. And I was like, I know they're hooking up. And I said something to her. I was like, you're fucking hooking up with him. And she's like, you're a bitch. And I was like, you're a fucking bitch. I hate you. All this mean stuff to her. And then I asked all my friends. And they're like, Chloe, like, you're crazy. You're delusional. Like, you're being a psycho. Then they start going on all trips together to, like, Mexico and all hanging out. And then I was apologizing to all of them. And I remember just, like, crying and crying and being so upset and apologizing to everyone. And then when I'd gotten back from all those rehabs... And I had that seizure. I was completely sober. I was on an abuse. I was just had hit such a bottom. And then I found out from one of them. I was like, they're like, oh, yeah, they actually had been hooking up. Mm. And I at that point, I was like, I have no friends. Everybody's been lying to me this whole time. You've been betrayed. You know, I was like gaslit. I was just like so depressed. That Rhea boyfriend was just like out, got a new girlfriend, whatever. And I was just just at such a bottom. You know, I was just so miserable, and so I just took some, a bunch of sleeping pills. Like, what did you take? 
I took a like a, a lot of uh, Seroquel and some okay. Ambien, and then um, how much did you take? I don't even know. And that that was like it didn't work, obviously. No, because right after I took it, I didn't want to die. I just wanted like some sort of attention. Help. And then I went to the same hospital I was born in. Hold on. You take all the, the meds. Do you throw it up? Yeah, and then I just started hysterically crying, and I called my sponsor. Mm. And then she called my mom, and then I just went to Lenox Hill Hospital. On the Upper East Side? Yeah, because I was at my mom's place uptown. Because I was too fragile to be anywhere else besides at my parents. And um, I had I had had my seizure, and I was put on Keppra, which is this medicine that I would kept asking to get off of because Keppra made me really suicidal. Right. Um. And so then that happened, and then after that, I ended up going into the psych ward, and uh, then from the psych ward, I got put in this in, in hospital rehab, and then from the in hospital rehab, I went to this place called um, Turnbridge. I know Turnbridge. The guy at Turnbridge. We've given away twenty two scholarships to rehab through a guy that works at Turnbridge. Jack. No, a guy named Justin. Okay, uh, and then I went to Turnbridge stories from there yeah I don't even... good stuff yeah <laughs> what do you wait, come on really we yeah. got time for all this i mean like unless you, so unless you have somewhere unless you have somewhere to the go police on Darnbridge. why because i i because i wanted to leave and they wouldn't let me leave and so this one girl who was like 20 was like do you really want to leave i was like can i fucking leave and they're like nope you can't i'm like i can leave i'm self-pay of course like, you can't leave she goes if you really want to leave you can call the police I was like, okay. So I called the police and I was like, I'm like, I'm calling the cops. And they're like, no, you're not. And I was like, okay. So I called the cops. I'm like, I'm at blah, 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 Orange Street. And they're holding my phone and stuff hostage. And the police come and they're like, give her a shit. And that's that. And then I left, checked into a hotel, got super fucked up, but I was on antabuse. So I was like throwing up. So you were drinking on antabuse? Were you taking anything else? I don't know, like seizure meds. And then I came back to New York and then I checked into Williams Workhouse. And then I was sober for like a, six months. And that's before this last relapse, uh, or the last the last couple months. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And then I hadn't been to rehab in like two years. And then in between that time, I would get six months, have a drink, five months, get a drink. And the only time I would relapse was because I would just be really bored, and all my friends were fucking partying, and I hang. It was people, places, things. Right. You know, it really was nothing very significant. It was uh, for me. It's always I get in a relationship, I drink. I decide I want to start dating again, I drink. It's. Um, boredom. I, I can't sit still with myself. Were you going to meetings or no? Yeah, I'll go to meetings and then I'll stop. I went through this phase this summer where I was just like, I don't fucking like AA. I'm sick of waking up every day and saying I'm an alcoholic. I don't wake up every day and say, hi, I'm Chloe. I have epilepsy. Hi, I'm Chloe. I have depression. I don't want to wake up every day and say, hi, I'm Chloe. I'm an alcoholic. And I stopped going to meetings and then I drank. But you don't have to. You don't yeah. have to do that. You know, know. it's like, I hated all of it. I hated every aspect of 12 step stuff until I was like, I just need to get better. It's like, and I, you know, I, I wound up going to 12 step and, and save my life, whatever, I because, know. because I did it. But do you know how many people listen to the show and they're like, stop pushing 12 step on people. There's a million different ways to get sober. You don't have to do it, but it works. <laughs> you know, it works it if you really, just do what they does. tell you to do. It does. And I know like a lot of these stories, maybe I sound like an asshole because it's like. You don't. I, and, and I want to tell you, this has been amazing. Like you've done incredible. Like I'm yeah. incredibly pleased to have you on the show. Um, when you tell yours, I know that when I look, had a, like a, a very short amount of time and I would tell everyone as much of my story as I could because I'm kind of trying to make sense of it in my head all these different places that you've been and all these things that you've it's done. Just, it's so, to me, there's just been so, so it's so much that to me it's, the chaos has become boring. Right, it's too much. It's, it's too much and my story, it's just, say I was going to qualify in a meeting, I forget my bottoms because there's so many. Right. I don't even remember, remember them. Um, you're like, when did this happen? When did this happen? And it's almost like I forget my bottoms. I don't even remember the, the uh, most of the bottoms because I'm just like the highlight. You remember like what makes it funny, what made it crazy. Like, and that is that the comedian in you trying to remember like the really flashiest, craziest mm -hmm. part? Yeah. You know, like I forget, you know, the days where I just write a suicide note and I stare at it for four hours. Right. You can't make that funny, really. 
<laughs> I, you know, the last one I wrote, I looked at it and I'm like, this is really boring. Right. This note is terrible. What, 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 what did it say? It was just like, I was like, hey, uh, yeah, I don't really feel like uh, Earth is for me. Sorry, everybody. Time to go. I'm out. <laughs> How many suicidal attempts did you have? Um, honestly, like, just that. And then, I mean, I've gone into, I've gone into places where I really, I couldn't stop drinking for, um, on like long, long stretches where I've gone into, um, alcoholic psychosis and, um, you know, I start hallucinating. Um, and so uh, this is dark and I don't think I've ever shared this but I've gone into like psychosis where it's so hard and I'm hearing things and I'm seeing things because I'm drinking for days and days all day and I've cut myself because I am trying to get back to reality to make the voices stop and and seeing things and that Um, which I don't even know if that's a suicide or or what it is. It's alcoholism. You know, it's like yeah. really progressive alcoholism. I mean, it's like the last time I drank, I'm just like, what? I'm just like, I hate, I hate drinking. You know, I just, I'm, I'm at a point where I hate drinking. I never thought I would really hate alcohol. I'm just like I'm getting to a point where I'm just like, I just want to do fucking pills. Okay. Which is not good. What do you want to do? I want to like, my, after my last boyfriend, I've just been like, always wanting to shoot coke. So you've wanted to shoot coke. I never loved shooting coke. Yeah. I didn't. Other people do. But they're always like, you're going to die. You are going to die. Because of my uh, uh, seizures. You're not missing anything. And I don't know how to say this. I think that's interesting that that's what goes in your head. Whenever I get blackout, I'm asking everybody. I'm like, does anyone know where I can get coke? I want to shoot coke. And what do they say? What are you talking? They're like, what? Why do you think you never shot coke before? No one will let me. Well, I mean, you, I mean, go get a needle. It's 50 cents. I shouldn't say that. But uh, you have, like, people, I think you were the person that wouldn't let yourself shoot coke, which is totally fucking a good thing. I, here's, a, here's a positive question, okay? See, I don't even think I should be saying this. What? I don't know. It's like, it's, these are just demons. How are you living with it? I mean, we're, we're two days out of the relapse. We're one day after the See, sometimes fucking... sometimes I'm like, I just relapse. Like, am I in a place where I should be even publicly sharing stuff? See, should we not use this? No, we should use it. But maybe maybe not the shooting coke part. I can take anything out. Yeah. Totally. Right, you know? I can take any. I, I personally... I mean, do you know how many people have been on the show and talked about shooting coke? Um, I've shot coke a bunch of times. Yeah. Um, but I didn't relapse this week and and have the vivitrol shot yesterday that's so, okay i mean i'm just i feel so blessed that i got it i was me texting, too i was texting my friend and i was just like before i was getting it i was like honestly thank god that i get to get this because i was at the funeral yesterday or on wednesday and i i drank and i was just like it was weird because i i i drank a few glasses of wine and i was feeling like shit and i'm i Everyone was like paying and getting coffee and I walked into it and I was going to the bar to get more drinks and I just was so tired and I just got in a cab and I went home and I took like my sleeping pills early and I was just like, tomorrow I get to get my shot. I'm so excited I get to get my shot and I just was praying and waiting until I got to get my shot. So I'm like, I just, so I don't have to do this anymore. One question before we stop, oh. which is... yeah. When you were in stretches of recovery, yeah. when's the the best you felt? The best I've felt? You know, it's hard for me because I don't handle um happiness is a tough is a tough one for me because I I chaos is a lot where I feel more comfortable because I've lived in it for so long. So once I get something that's too euphoric or, or happy, I I get worried it's going to be taken away. So my therapist always says, you like to jump before you get pushed. And so that's a lot of why I relapse. And because I'm scared. And I get scared of feelings. 
um, which is why I pick up a lot. And that's why it's hard for me to get into relationships. The happiest I've ever felt was when I was not dating anyone, when I was just doing comedy, when I was actually not smoking cigarettes, um, when I was not dependent on anything, right. when I had no one to answer to. When you felt free. That's it, yeah. Well, that makes sense. And uh, when you're doing comedy, and so much of your comedy is around this stuff, like, do you feel like do you feel like you can walk away from using and still be funny? I'm only funny when I'm sober. Okay. And do you or, or who are your favorites? Were your favorites like the most hardcore fuck ups in comedy, like the 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 ridiculous alcoholic drug addict comedians? Mm. No. I just like talent. All right. I like any talent. It doesn't even matter the level of what they use. I just like people who are so original and raw and and vulnerable. It, it doesn't matter. I like comedians who are up and coming. I just, I laugh at things that often I find that I laugh when other people aren't laughing. Me too. You know, I laugh at the awkward pauses. Me too. At the, yes. You know, I embarrass my daughter all the time. Yeah. She's like, Daddy, you're laughing at the wrong part. But I mean, I love Jessica Kirsten. Uh -huh. I think she's incredible. I think Shane Gillis is really funny. Emma Wellman is one of my favorites. Um, I love, there's so many amazing comics out there. Um, who else do I love? I love Louie. Mm -hmm. What's love, he up to? Where is he at? He's, at, he's touring. Okay, good. Um, I love. I just, I like, uh, I don't know. I like everyone. Well, good. And I, I'm, listen, this has been an emotional roller coaster for me because you're <laughs> so fucking raw and so vulnerable. And it's like, I only want good things for you. And I don't want to be like, if you do this, this, and this, yeah. your life's going to be amazing. But it's true. If you do this, this, and this, you can get, you can get there. Yeah, I hope you so. Know? I want to be there. You'll get there. I have faith in you. Thank you. I think you can Thanks do it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. I hope I helped somebody. I'm sure you helped a ton of people. Yeah. If, if, if you feel helped by Chloe, send in an email to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. And thank you, Chloe. Follow me on Instagram. Oh, follow her on Instagram. What about your YouTube news show? Oh, yeah. I'm going to start that up again. It's called News for Women. I, I break down the news so women can get it. I think we're going to start doing dopey news. Do you want to be great. a dopey news roving reporter? I would love to. All right, great. That would be fabulous. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Chloe, thank you. So, whoa, that was Chloe LeBranch, as raw as it gets. So and like, raw. But before we really dive into that incredibly in-depth and raw interview, I want to tell you guys to subscribe to the Stupid YouTube channel None of you guys are subscribing to the YouTube channel. There's tons of good stuff on there. There's fucking ice cream reviews. There's the newest piece is behind the dope where you get some serious, serious dopey stories. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check it out. I also forgot to tell you to buy the merch. There's so much merch out there. Go to dopeypodcast.com. Check out the new shit. The Mantis with the Mushroom. The fucking Oyve hoodie is finally available. Oyve long sleeve. All through our partners, SRO Printing out of Cincinnati. If you need any printing done, just go to SROprints.com and they will take care of all of your printing needs. I have a shitload of beanies and fucking socks and snapbacks. So hit me up on social media, contact me, and, and I'll get you the amazing dopey merch you need. And now back to our post-game Chloe LeBranch interview with Aaron. And like one thing after the other, but like, I, I, I don't know if I should say this or not, but after we did the interview, she asked me if I knew anybody like that might be able to sponsor her. And I was like, I don't know. I was going to give her to Aurora, but Aurora doesn't live in New York. And then I remembered I knew this woman and I connected with them together and they, uh, they're they working together That's now. That's awesome. So maybe that'll be a good, uh, a good thing for both of them. Yeah. And I would love to hear your guys' opinion about Chloe fucking as raw as it gets. Send us an email to dopeypodcast at gmail.com. But I, I was under the impression that I think it will help some people. I think so too. I think it's important to have a variety of people on the show at different points in their recovery. And I think it's important to remember like what it's like being that raw. And 
And a lot of people listening to the show are not, are not in recovery yet. Right. Right. And I, I just, I'm very, and she has amazing, um, stand up. You can check her out on Instagram. She has a YouTube channel. I think she's going to be a part of our dopey news. Mm -hmm. She's going to be the dopey news roving reporter type person. So I'm excited, uh, to have Chloe involved period. Yes. So what do you got? So a couple of note for my notes, <laughs> which I didn't print out today because my printer wasn't working. Uh, I thought that she talked about like at one point, like taking subs for fun. And I was just like, that has got to be so fucking bleak. Well, I remember one time where I wasn't too strung out on dope. And uh, I went to meet my, the connection that I was seeing at mm -hmm. the time. It was like the beginning of a relapse. And he was like, I don't have any heroin, but I have subs. And it was mm -hmm. the first time I ever took subs. And I got higher from his subs really? than I ever did from his dope. Because they have like, I, I thought you don't really get high from it. I think I did. Because I think it was, I don't know, it was, they were, there were those big eight milligram orange dudes, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the octet, the hexagonal right. orange ones that you put on your tongue. And I got higher from that than I was getting on. Maybe the dope was total garbage, but right. yeah. Um, also just like, I mean, the whole time that I was listening, there were a few things. Like I just kept thinking like, uh, like my heart was just like hurt <laughs> while I was listening to some of this because I've been there in, in in a lot of sort of like those places like on the precipice of relapse when she was talking about sort of like her patterns and and I, I remember being in that place of just not being able to get time together and and so it was you know there were times that I was just like I was a grateful for my recovery and then just my heart goes out to her you know um I thought it was important like she was talking about like even though she's miserable, she keeps trying. Yeah. Like sometimes that's what it takes. Um, this has come up before. This came up when you um, interviewed Lowe's from Brutal Recovery about this idea of like when, like Chloe said, being on stage takes away the anxiety, which is similar to what uh, what Lowe's said. And I think that that's so true. I think it's because it's it's another, like you can pretend to be this other version of yourself when you're performing. Um, I think that's part of it. But the other thing is you find the thing that you love and you forget all the things that you hate. Right. You know, you find something that you love to do and all of a sudden you're supercharged with this spirit, totally. which is what you're supposed to be trying to do in recovery anyway to fill that God sized hole or whatever. hundred percent. So it's like you, you also don't have time to think about yourself. And to, to hate yourself or to overthink or to be super self-centered. This is me. Like, this is for me, like with writing, I think it's the same with the podcast. I mean, like sitting here doing this podcast with you now, I'm not thinking about all my dumb shit. You mm -hmm. know, I'm here, I'm present, I'm like involved in something. So it's like a similar, I think it's awesome. So I hope she keeps it up. Um, she also much like Lowe's and myself, like 13 is that fucked up age <laughs> where a lot of stuff goes wrong. And I, I just remember as a parent, like being so scared when my older son turned 13, because I know that that's like a really crucial turning point for a lot of people when it comes to like mental health and addiction. Nothing happened to me at 13. <laughs> I made out with uh, Dana Schneider at Bear Mountain. <laughs> I ate a lot of French bread pizza, watched a lot of 21 Jump Street. Oh, was it Stouffer's? Yeah, of course. Is there is there any other no, brand of French know, bread I, pizza? I fucking love Stouffer's French bread pizza. Um, when she talked about being arrested for underage drinking in Texas, she said she wolf bit the beer. And I was like, so uh, what the hell is that? Have you I should have asked. I don't know it what It implied is. that she has fangs and she was like, ah, and it's like, Oh, uh, okay, okay. I don't know. I'm I've sure. I've never heard that before. But, you know, side note, like I never liked beer. I mean, like I got like, like for like a second, like a sip or something, but I can't imagine getting drunk on beer. Well, yeah, yeah I've, I, I've, I've, I, I never got drunk bloated. on beer ever. <laughs> But I never drank a lot. Um, you never saw Teen Wolf, where 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 T Teen Wolf bites the beer and it does mm, that. I vaguely remember it. I think that's probably where the wolf bite comes from. But I think Chloe LeBranch, that one of the things about her that was so epic was the number of rehabs and the number of fuck ups at rehab and how how well she remembers it. But I guess she's still young. She's totally yeah. in it. I don't know. I have a pretty good memory of my fucked up stuff too. Me, I, I, I do to some extent. Yeah. Well. You always talk about how your memory is so terrible. I don't think your memory is as bad as you think it is. I know. I just wish I had, I, I remember I, I like had just gotten back from California 
and how much I long to be able to like have something, a device that could play my memories. Back. Right. Like I wanted that more than anything. It's um, called a journal. <laughs> right. Well, well, I mean, my, my journal now is not like that either. I just wish there was some way to like access whatever is in your brain to see what you've seen. Um, You're going to do that through writing. Well, thank you. And, and my, and you know, I've been writing, I'm, I know. I'm writing like a fucking idiot over here <laughs> now. Um, so you, you enjoyed Chloe. I did enjoy it. And then two other really quick things. I loved that Alan's phone played a, um, made a small cameo. In yes. the episode. Yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate that. And then she mentioned phenobarbital and how she loved phenobarbital and nobody ever talks about it. It's not something I did recreationally, but I don't know if you remember this. That's how I got poisoned by that crazy ex-boyfriend. With phenobarbital. And that was, was also, phenobarbital. that was also even more famously the drug that Chris, uh, in a blackout tried to rob the uh, veterinarian That's clinic right. for it was phenobarbital. And I never liked phenobarbital. And, I don't really remember it. I just got sick. No, I had phenobarbital a million times in detox. And I would always be like, if it was phenobarbital mm-hmm. or if it was clonidine, I'd be like, come on, you know. Trazodone. I remember all those. I don't like any drugs. of those. Yeah. yeah. Like, I like methadone. I liked it when they give you Ativan, mm-hmm. like fucking uh Valium. That's the most, the best rehab. Drug. I know you guys talked about like Clonopin or Xanax or something, you know, like all those. And I know like you had a problem with benzos when you were using, but like, it's really weird. I never, ever got anything off of benzos other than like, if I was having a panic attack, I never used them recreationally. I used them when I was trying to kick heroin, but they never really worked for me in the way they worked for other people. Well, it's like Coke didn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just one of an alcohol, like didn't work for me well yeah. enough. And weed doesn't work for so many people. Right. It's just like, it's, it's amazing. Chemistry. It's amazing. It's chemistry. I think we're hitting the end of another exciting action packed episode of dopey. Um, go to Patreon. There's, there's an ask Aaron video yes. that's up this week on Patreon. So that's exciting. There's a whole bunch of ask Aaron stuff. On and Patreon. we have to do, I promise someone who's written to us that I would answer an ask Aaron question this week. So we have to do one for Patreon this week. Done. Okay. No problem. So look for that and uh, look for Ask Aaron and Aaron back on Dopey soon. Look for the Dopey News. Look for Chloe LeBranch in the Dopey News soon. Send in a voicemail, an email. What did you think of Willie? What did you think of Chloe LeBranch? Thank you for coming through, Aaron. It was a pleasure as always. Thank you. Stay strong. Oh, you know what? Before we go, I'm going to read a fucking the new. No, I'll save it for my dad. Okay. <laughs> Look for my dad coming up on a new episode and he'll be reading reviews nice. and that uh, will say stay strong dopey nation and fucking toodles for Chris. Toodles for Chris. What's up Dave and Chris. My name's Jake. I'm 25 years old from West Virginia. I just found dopey about two weeks ago and it's my favorite podcast of all time. Y'all are s- hilarious and it's just gotten me through some really hard times and Though I'm not clean myself, you know, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Um, I really like Dave's song, and I'm going to do a little cover of it here on my banjo. Hope y'all don't mind too much. I wrote a uh, third verse myself. Sorry about the poor quality. It's just on my phone. And, uh, sorry about the banjo. This thing's hard to keep in tune. <clears throat> Take a walk around the world I wonder would it do me any good Till I get some honey in my pockets And I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood and I want to be good so bad I'll be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desires all I ever had Wanna take a ride up in the sky Watch as airplanes just pass me by And I wanna see a Learjet liner take a dive Just to show all of these people what it means to be alive I wanna be good so bad Wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I wanna be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had 
In my burned out basement listening to the dopey show Home friends I had her on this little radio I keep checking on my pulse because it feels like I might die But the thought straightening up sounds so much better when you're high And I wanna be good so bad I wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I wanna be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had I hope y'all hear this. Makes it through the uh, big inbox emails. Feel free to play a clip on the show if you want. Uh, if not, I know it kind of sucks. All right, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, y'all.